Hello and welcome to Ignite Session 16. We've got Sandra Jones here with us Woo -hoo! today to talk about working with buyers and sellers. So yesterday we had Trey who works a lot with listings, right? A lot of sellers. And then before that, we had Tawny who strictly really works with buyers. So we've got somebody in front of you today that has made a living doing both yep. very successfully. Both. So Cass, how long have you been in real estate? Two years, one month. 26 days. Who's counting? Who is counting this girl? I'm still that. I'm still new. I'm still and not what is one of your big aspirations with KW? I do want to be a bold coach. Ooh. And it's very hard to get there. I have to do 75 transactions a year for two years. Yeah. My max is 12. So far. So far. <laughs> but she's working the systems and the models to get herself going in the right direction. Um, really excited to have you here today. Capped last year. She did cap. It took 11 months, but I capped. This year, my goal is to cap by September. Uh, April is my annual, so I I need three more, and I think I cap. Yeah, well on her way. So well, yeah, I want I want all that money. <laughs> yeah, it's important because that's when once you cap, that's when it really starts clicking and things start working. So we're yeah. very excited for you today. You guys are going to learn a ton from Cassie. She is a huge resource and very good friend of mine, and I love her so much. All right, without further ado, here you go. Is there anybody online? Tell me if you're online. Uh, there's no one on. I that's what I thought. Okay. So if anybody pops up, let me know so I don't miss it because I'm not good at looking at that. Um, so like she said, I am Cassandra Jones. I go by Cassie, Cass, Cassandra, whatever you want to call me. I'll <laughs> come to just about anything. Um, oh, what are you doing? You can hear it. Just like she on. said, I've been in this for two years and just a month. And my biggest aha, and if you haven't heard this yet, is don't re don't try to re remake the wheel. Do exactly what everybody's telling you to do. Um, you will have to make some mistakes because you do have to fail in order to fail up. You've got to do it to know, oh, that didn't work, but do what they say to do. I tried, I'm recreative, I'm entrepreneurial, which is not what we want to be. And I know how to do this. No, I didn't. And so my first full year, I did two transactions. And then last year I did 12 transactions. So, um, big difference. Oh, there's three. Let's see. Tammy is connecting. And then the other two are me, so training center. So make sure if she does any um, text messages, let me know or any messages. Um, but do what they say and do it like they say to do it. You can put your own spin on it and be you, but do what they say to do um, and find where you love, find where you live and do that. Um, I love open houses and that's where 80% of my, we'll say 60, 60% of my transactions come from open houses and 40% come from referrals. There's maybe one, come in, come in. There's maybe uh, one or two that I got from Facebook leads. I'm still working all of those. They're in my database and I still call them, but they have not been fruitful, but open houses and things like that have. So make sure you're doing all of those things. Find what you love. If you like making phone calls all day, make phone calls all day. Um, so today, like she said, we're working with buyers and sellers, and this is from you signing the contract. So yesterday you signed the contract, and then tomorrow you're going to learn how to negotiate the contract. Today we're going to talk about all that meaty stuff in the middle and how we give world-class service to our clients. Um, and so we're going to break it down to buyers and sellers and how we work with each one of them. Um, so we do want to make sure that at the end of the class, we do all of our success factors, doing our notes. Is everybody doing that? Are you doing your thank you cards and your calls? It makes a big difference. It's wonderful when you get a call and they say, oh my God, this was handwritten. It wasn't a computer. Yeah, it's terrible handwriting. That's why, you know, it was a, it was a human being because I scribble. Um, okay. So we're going to get started. Does anybody have a birthday this month? Next month? All right, Corey. I'm July. Oh, in July. Oh, are you a Leo or are you? Yeah, I'm Leo too. I'm August first, so I'm, I'm right July twenty eighth. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, so what have you really put into action so far from what you've taken from Ignite? What's like really been your? Oh my gosh, that's what I'm gonna just like drill in and start doing. I love the handwritten letters or the cards. Um. That to me has been life changing to just mm -hmm. not even discuss real estate, mm -hmm. but just encourage somebody where they're at. Yeah, tell them what you call it. 
I call it happy mail. Oh, I love it. So I'm like, I'm just sending you some happy mail um, to just encourage. That's nice. And the amount of people that have responded back, that it was exactly what they needed to add oh, that day has been. That's amazing. Pretty amazing. Start some happy mail. It, it's because all I'm getting is credit card applications. And that's all I'm getting. And so, <laughs> or, you know, somebody wants an invite or so, you know, it's never yeah. just, hey, I'm thinking about you. Yeah. I just wanted to pour into you. That's awesome. Um, yeah, yeah, it's been really, really amazing. Love it. And then you can, that conversation can start happening more. I think that's nicer because they're calling you and then you can really deep you know, dive into their happiness and their life and everything rather than you going, hey, I was just thinking about you. Let's talk. That feels weird yeah. to me too. I'm still trying to figure that one out. Okay. Anybody else want to talk about what they have really put into effect from Ignite that you just really like, that was amazing. I'm going to do that. Um, Like executing, like, like finding your niche and like trying to capitalize on that to get your leads. And what's your niche? Uh, business to business. Oh, good. So. I'm trying to take that route. Yeah, a it's a great way to go. I feel like that's what Blake Cook did. Yeah. He did a lot of business to business. So great idea, it's a way to go. So today um, we're going to talk about um, several things and we're gonna be able to identify key information to build success with buyers and sellers, employ strategies to assist buyers and sellers with their decision-making and build a strong success foundation with their clients and um, your other agent. And that's a big part of this too. I don't think anybody was in my last class. No, you were in my last class. I did negotiating. And this is a huge thing that I learned way in the beginning when I started was create a really good relationship with that other agent and make it easy for that other agent. It goes so far to, um, to creating really great relationships with them. And in the future, you may be able to get, you may be able to get into a deal because you were so great last time and there may be a multiple offer situation or like, oh my gosh, she was great or he was great. Let's, you know, they might try to pull that offer. Um, and so, and it's just great integrity to be able to just like own that transaction and really help along the way. So real quick, what else, what do you guys want to get out of today? What kind of questions do you have? What, what have you not heard that maybe you um, need help with or, Anything in that middle? I actually will ask, who has written contracts and has clients? Okay, three, four. Oh, good. Okay, excellent. So not super new news, but maybe some. We always find something new. What kind of obstacles or what things you are you trying to overcome and need a little bit of help with? When it's with the working with the buyer and seller in between the, the listing appointment or the buyer's agency appointment and have going under contract and negotiating. All that meaty stuff inside. Getting them to show up to the appointment. Right. Okay. For like showings or for the contract, for like agency? Uh, for agency. Okay. Are you having any trouble with them coming to listing? I mean, coming to showings? Are they canceling on you? Okay. Show us. I mean, that's, that's a possibility. Why, why would somebody be can, canceling their showing appointments? So then we have to work on those objections and go back to the beginning. If we already have them under agency and they're starting to get nervous, take a step back and help them do that. Okay, what other questions or what other ideas that we need to, to, us, uh, to talk about today? Well, helping them work through that nervousness and... Um, you know, and the emotional part of it, because sometimes they don't, they forget what I, you know, what we talked about up front, and I have to like, remind them how long the inspection period is, things like that, and it just be really hard working through their emotions. Okay. Anything else? Um. Like with buyers, when you're in that in-between stage, you're trying to find them something, but mm -hmm. like keeping that, like keeping that relationship, like, you know, you've made some progress, show them some places, not finding the one, like trying keep to the, keep the relationship alive. Yeah. Yeah. I would say managing their emotions after rejection. So if you're representing the buyer and they've been rejected on 
who knows how many offers mm -hmm. yeah. just how do you just keeping them engaged in their morale up yeah. given that it's not always fun people don't like rejection that's that's amazing that's really good because we're, we're experiencing that and we're exper we're experiencing multiple offers again mm -hmm. we're experiencing gap um uh, appraisal gaps uh, el uh escalation clauses <laughs> i would say just managing their emotions through all of that through yeah. the inspection through the appraisal yeah. through yeah sure well yeah we'll talk yeah we'll talk about that that's amazing i think that's we can't read that oh so. you can't is it too mm -hmm. far am i just i see i told it's, it's the color right. it's the color <gasps> it's the color so like it looks like squiggles up there for us but oh no oh that's, no, that's better works. now it's going to be in 3d <laughs> <laughs> it's better than in Butter. Yeah. <laughs> it looks very patriotic. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> nerves and emotions <clears throat> and the whole process. Ooh. Keep hopes. Mm -hmm. uh, can you read it? Is it now worse? Yeah, we can yeah, read. Oh, good. <laughs> When you will you also put your phone number up there for us? Yes, yes. Kind of a prereq that we're requiring. Uh, yes. Not your airdrop. I got you. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Justin's always yeah. airdrop. I have a Samsung, so. Oh, Yay, sorry. Me too. Yeah. Androids are the best. Well, that's not my phone number. I think I was going to write my social security number on there. Oh my goodness. Nice. You got to go buy a house on my credit. Okay, so those are, that's actually really great. Is there anything else that we want to talk about or make sure that we talk about by the end of the class? And I don't know how long your guys' classes have gone, if they're like finished at three or two or one thirty. I can talk, so we might be here a while. And I love this information, so I want to make sure that we get it across. Let's go to, there it is. Um, so success with clients, success with buyers, success with sellers, success with co-agents, recaps, ahas, and then your daily success system. That's what we're gonna go over today. And Samantha, will you read this for me? Virtually every top producing agent we have ever worked with has a deep and almost inherent sense of service. They have a servant's heart and place their buyer's or seller's real estate experience above all else. They are always thinking service. And this is difficult sometimes because this is how we pay for our house and how we feed our children. So it's it's hard when you know there's a monetary thing behind it, but if you really go in with that servant's attitude, you're going to go a lot further. You're going to be um, so much more in tune with your clients and they're gonna be more in tune with you. I heard, I'm listening to a book right now called The Three Minute, oh my gosh, I forgot what it is. Three Minute Way, Three Minute Pitch. I can't remember. It's like your elevator pitch, your value proposition. And he said, there's there's two ways that you go about your business with through, um, through dedication or passion. And passion is visible and it's seen and it's out and it's on your surface and it's about serving other people. If you're dedicated, you're just trying to get to that end. That's all you're trying to do. You're just trying to get to that end um, rather than go through that whole process and be along the way. So I thought that was really interesting that he kind of explained it like that. It's a really good book, though. It's helped me with like my value proposition coming up with um, how to come up with that. Doop, doop, doop. There we go. Okay. So great agent and client communication provides a strong foundation for a sustaining relationship, sets and manages expectations proactively throughout the transaction, and creates peace of mind for your clients and enhances your credibility. Um, so the key to success with your clients is communication. We've covered this, including using command, the KW app, um, commuting to your value, to your uh, SOI and your leads. So I have to read some of this because there's a lot. Um, great communication is the foundation for great relationships with your clients. Remember, they are trusting you with what is likely their biggest financial decision and what will serve as the foundation for their lives and the lives of their family. So in your participant book, 
There is on page, weird page numbers, let me find it. 16.3, is that what yours is now? Okay, good, I have the same one. So when we talk about provides a strong foundation for a sustaining relationship, what does that mean to you? I think you gotta cultivate the relationship. If that's anything I've learned the most in Ignite is cultivating a consistent relationship and mm -hmm. nurturing it. Yeah. And that you do that, your foundation is strong and it sustains right. itself. Yeah. You're talking with them and you're listening to them. Remember, that's a lot of it is listening to what they say, have your question, and then let them do the talking. What about sets and manages expectations proactively throughout the transaction? You have to communicate to know what they're expecting of you, and then they need to know what you're expecting of them. And that needs to be done early and often. Mm -hmm. um, right early and often so that there's no there's no disconnect between those standards and expectations you each have for yourself. And how can we do this? How do we communicate with them? In every form, I mean, email, verbally, yep. written, like if you're gonna give them a packet, it needs to be in there mm -hmm. um, in all forms because it takes people eight different ways before they get it. So exactly. yeah. if you're only doing verbal, they're probably not going to get everything you're saying. If you're only doing written, they may not read it all. Right. So I do think it takes a combination of different communication tactics. I agree. I agree completely. So we can do text messages. We can do phone calls. We can do emails. You could do messenger, mm -hmm. you know, on Facebook. It's, how many of you um, friend your client on Facebook or potential client on Facebook? Good. I recommend it. Unless you're doing something you don't want them to see, then okay. <laughs> Maybe make a fake account, do a fake, it's a fake Facebook if you want. Something happened to your PowerPoint. Oh, oh no. I didn't touch it. Let's try this. Okay. No, it's still doing it, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, I don't know. Slideshow? Yeah, go to slideshow mode, which is the TV looking deal. Oh, weird. weird. I wasn't even anywhere near it. Isn't that funny? Um, yeah. Friend your friend them on Facebook because that creates another avenue to communicate with them, whether you're liking their posts or you know, putting something on their congratulations or finding out they just had a baby, all of those things. And that's ways for you to get back and communicate with them. And I have not had anybody not not Facebook with me. Now I've not have had trouble finding people and not being able to connect with them, but I've not had anybody say, no, I don't want to be your friend. Everybody's like, oh no. But I put a lot of dog pictures on mine. So you get some cute stuff. Um, creates peace of mind for your clients. How do we do that? Well, hopefully your communication is addressing any rational, irrational fears they have before they have them. Mm -hmm. And if you're communicating effectively, then that should be one of the goals in doing so. Yeah. So absolutely. they know that if something happens, you're going to be there to work through it with them. They mm -hmm. know, hey, I'm going to give you what's going to happen ahead of time so that when it happens, you're not scared, you're not frightened, you're not right. angry, you're not whatever that emotion is. Yeah. It's truly communication helps manage the emotions. It, it sure does. And, and like you said, tell them what's going to happen or what could happen. Mm -hmm. So we write an offer for 15,000 under on a $200,000 house. Oh, What's the likelihood, <laughs> you know, and how do we do this in a way that we keep them on board, mm -hmm. you know? So what's the reason you want to offer 15,000 under and dig down into that? Like, I get it. I'll write that offer for you. But why, why, why is that important to you? And let them tell you why it's important and then give them the feedback of what the likelihood is. If it's been on the market for 180 days, it might be okay. If it came on yesterday, it's going to be gone tonight, you know, so really um, give that peace of mind, but also be honest with them. And that should have been a question in your, in your um, agency um, conversation. How honest do you want me to be with you? Do you want it to be a little passive aggressive honest? Or do you want me to like hammer it in and tell you? Um, or do you want me to just blow sunshine? <laughs> um, it enhances your credibility. What does, what does that mean? When you say something that you're going to do something, you follow through and you do yeah. it. And like any type of problem solving that comes up, you know, you're, you take the reins and, exactly. and, and handle it and right. be accountable for anything that you do wrong. 
And when you were doing your agency and you promised you were going to do an open, you're going to do six open houses if that's what it takes over three weeks because it's about 18 days right now average for a home to be sold. I'm going to do open houses every weekend. And then after the first weekend, you don't do any more. Mm. It's not very credible. You're not going to get a lot of referrals because you didn't say what you were going to do. I'm going to send emails. I'm going to go, I'm going to walk and talk to every single agent in the office and um, show them your home, you know? So whatever it is that you've promised to do, you're going to do it. And that's a tough one because sometimes we make a lot of promises during the day and we're like, oh my gosh, <clears throat> who have I forgotten? Because I didn't write it down. It's just in my head. And so you got to go through your day. So really, really keeping um, ahead of that and making sure use all your um, tools that you can to stay on top of that. So the three levels of service is our purpose, our value proposition, and our fiduciary. A lot of these have probably been talked about a little bit, right? I feel like I came in and... Um, uh, Ashton was talking about, oh no, it was Monica Keltz was talking about fiduciary quite a little bit. And then value proposition would have been, did Brian do that? No, it was, no. It was um, yeah, it, yeah, it was Brian Stone. Brian Stone oh, did Brian. value. Yeah. Value proposition. And then purpose is kind of in there too. I think that might've been, that might've even been Monica, but it kind of intertwines into all of the things that we're doing um, when we're talking about those things. So when we're talking about purpose, we're masters of service and have a clear understanding of why they should be hired or why you should be hired and can articulate to anyone at any time. Great service begins with a clear purpose for why someone should work with you. So do you guys all feel like I am the smartest real estate agent out there. I can go out and do anything that needs to be done. And I am the best one to do it. Of course. <laughs> and that's okay. Listen to <laughs> no, really. I mean, and if you do, that's okay. I have that same sense. I still have um, imposter syndrome, you know, because I was something else for so long that I'm still learning how to do this. And I get a little bit better each day. But I still have that, like, am I really the best person to be doing this? Um, but I know that I go in and I learn and I ask questions and I have 450 agents and amazing brokers and people that I can talk to to help me through that situation. So that's going to get me where I need to be. But we do want to make sure that we understand. And if we don't, we got to ask those questions. Value proposition, the best agents can translate their purpose and why people should hire them into a specific set of services they will provide. Does anybody want to share their value proposition that you wrote for yourself? Go ahead, Go ahead AI. Go ahead, AI. <laughs> we throw them under the bus every time. Oh, oh, yeah. Sorry, we love you, Clayton. Yeah, I'll find it. <laughs> okay. And I am, I'm still working on mine, and, I, and I've gone through a value proposition class probably four times. And again, that imposter syndrome takes over. My brain takes over. It's like, who do you think you are? You know, and so I'm, I'm, I am, I'm, I'm trying to think, who am I? And what is it that I'm trying to do? Because, you know, we talk about our why, you know, because a lot of times the why is in our value proposition. My why at the beginning was so my husband could retire. Well, my clients don't want that. They don't care. They're not concerned. You know what I mean? Like they don't care that I need to sell houses so my husband can retire. What's in it for them? So I had to kind of go a little bit further than that. And what I really enjoy the most is teaching people while they're in that transaction. So I love going over the contracts with them and talking through the different pieces of it so that they understand it is an important document, but what it actually means. And then when we go and learn about escrow, you know, we just say escrow or we just say earnest money, like everybody should know what that is. I'm going to tell you probably 15% of the population actually know what that is. So I explain every single thing. I explain about current rating taxes. Remember doing that in class in your uh, real estate school? The worst. Oh, so that and cap rate. Just mm -hmm. stop. Just stop. No. Um, but we, we need to teach them how to do that because, you know, if it's a cash deal, they're going to have to pay their taxes at the end of the year, but they're still prorated, but you're going to get that money today. So save that $462 so that you can pay it in December. If you've got a mortgage, they pay the $462, you pay the $345, and then they know taxes are going to be paid at the end of the year by your mortgage company. A lot of people don't know that. And especially if you have first-time homebuyers, they absolutely do not know that. 
So that's where my value proposition comes in is I want to be in that journey with them and buying a home, making it fun, making it educational, and then understanding exactly what they did, and they won't be afraid to buy another home. So that's what I'm trying to write up for my value proposition. Mm. And I want my husband to retire. He's a cop, so I want him out of there. Let me turn pages. Sorry, guys. I don't know if everybody else has to read, but I do. Um, so, oh, wait. Oh, fiduciary. Sorry. We're going to go a little bit further into fiduciary. What is fiduciary? Because I know you guys have gone over it. In client's best interest before your own. Yeah. <laughs> when you operate as a fiduciary for your clients, you earn the right to be their, their expert of choice. And it's a person that, let me read this right. A functionary has a specific tax relate relationship with clients. They do the job by dotting the I's and crossing the T's. A fiduciary is in a high trust relationship with clients and always puts their best interest at the forefront, even before the agent's own interest. So exactly what you said. And um, what, what term or what kind of job could we do if we were just a functionary? Transaction. Yeah, a transaction broker. Yeah. So if we were just doing the transaction, it would literally be a fiduciary. We pushing the pushing the papers over, making them sign that you cannot, you can't even advise them whether they should counter, how much they can counter. You literally are just putting that paper in front of them. So I think that's a I, that's a very difficult thing, which is why Don, you guys all took his class, is like, just don't do that. You know, it's too hard not to get involved with them, but you're not allowed to because they're not your client. They're not, you are not their fiduciary. And that's the same with um, somebody who asks you for advice. That's tricky because you give them advice, but they're not, you're not their fiduciary. What if they're under, what if they're under representation by somebody else? Mm -hmm. So your best friend calls and says, hey, tell me what my house is worth. Okay, that sounds great. I want to see how much your house is worth. What have you talked to any other um, real estate agents? Well, I talked to you know, find out. And if they've signed with them, you can't give them any information. And they're no longer your best friend. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at that point, be like, okay, so why did we not talk about this? But they could. I mean, they could be in Joplin, and maybe you don't want to travel to Joplin, or they think you don't want to travel to Joplin. It's happened. But we've got to be really careful about that. When, when they're under agency, we are their fiduciary. When we're not, we've got to be really careful about offering advice to people that we don't have a connection with. Go forward. And then, hold on. Let's see what this one is. Oh yeah. So dual agency. Has anybody done dual agency? Oh wow. Okay. How did you enjoy it? Um, I think you have to be incredibly careful to make sure that you're staying middle of the road and that you're communicating everything back and forth and that you let them know there's a lot more communication mm -hmm. that goes into it. And there's a lot more to me, I had to hold myself a lot more accountable and a lot, mm -hmm. like I truly had to define for both of them up front. This is how I'm going to be. If this is not something that you like, I'll refer one of you off right. to, you know, to an agent that'll be more than happy mm -hmm. to represent you. And so I just, it makes you hold yourself to a higher standard. Yeah. And you truly, if you're going to serve as a dual, you, you truly need to make sure that you're doing that role yeah. and that you don't put the interest of either one before the other. And that's tough, especially when you started, you mm -hmm. promised that person you'd be their fiduciary. Yes. So, and how was your experience, Clayton? Uh, ours was, uh, it was a property that was an investment property. He wanted X amount and we're like, well, let's present it to one of our buyers. Um, and so it wasn't, it wasn't too bad for the simple fact that the seller knew that it was one of our buyers and they said, yeah, this is what I want for the property. Mm -hmm. And it was a very, like that's how we market. It's a very fair value for that property. Um, and if it would have gone to market, our buyer wouldn't have had a shot because mm -hmm. 
somebody would have gone in no contingencies mm -hmm. and they just wouldn't have had a shot. Yeah. So, so the relationships were there though. So we yeah. actually already created that foundation yeah. to where they could trust us and they knew that we could take care of both sides. But of I've it. also declined dual agency yeah. as well. So mm -hmm. I've represented a Sorry. seller before mm -hmm. and I had a buyer who was like, no, I'll be fine with for you to represent both my seller. I'll be fine. But there was no way I could do that because of the status of the property or just the complexities of the property. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel like from a fiduciary responsibility and just from a bandwidth that it would be appropriate. And mm -hmm. so I think we need to recognize when it's not appropriate right. to do that too, because it sounds real good that you'll get a double paycheck. And, and if money's your thing, mm -hmm. go there. Money's not my thing. So I don't go there very often. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was more... I want to do the very best job. And I'm telling you that while I could, I don't want to have to put myself in that position. Right. So I'm going to refer, and I referred the buyer, I'm going to refer you to somebody who's going to walk through and she's going to communicate very, very closely mm -hmm. with me and you'll be in great hands. Yep. Um, but you have to know also when it's a good time to decline. Right. And not to just take that every single time. Right because it's not always what's best for you mm -hmm. because you do have a legal obligation and it's not always best for what's what's best for one or the other client. Mm -hmm. yeah, and in my case, I knew it was not going to be the best right. for my seller. Yeah, it sucks. Does everybody know what dual agency is or has a really good get grasp of it? Good. I don't mind it. Like I'm dual agency right now in one and it's super easy deal and investment property, kind of the same thing. And if you've got that foundation, mm -hmm. that's good. And see, I always think about because whenever I'm doing a buyer's uh, agency when I'm doing my my presentation with them, one of my strategies is to call and find them a house. Sure. I'm gonna I'm gonna call neighborhoods that they like, and I'm gonna see if anybody's willing to sell to them. Mm -hmm. So I've already told them that's my strategy, and so that's when I bring in the dual agency on the agency contract, and then tell them, you know, ask them if they're okay with me being on both sides, but then knowing that. If it gets to a point where we need to have some negotiations, we're going to bring somebody else in because you do have to still do the best for both sides. You do. So if the HVAC is out, you're, you're telling your guy, no, you don't have to fix that. You're telling this guy, yeah, I'd ask to fix that. Knowing in your head, you just told them two different things, but mm -hmm. you've got to do it. Can I come up with a solution to that? What if we do a home warranty? What if we get it up and fixed? You know, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. So every time I read that to my client, I'll, I just, when I'm with them, I'm like, Ugh. Well, I <laughs> makes me nervous. Yeah. I purposefully answered that question, no, even if they were like, oh yeah, we're okay with that. Mm -hmm. There, not every client is a good dual agency client, no. and you need to know that too, right? And that, not just the property, but and the you client. You may not ever home. have that, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to go find them, and then I'm going to refer them out because mm -hmm. you're still getting paid. So I think you yeah. kind of still do, and we're gonna. It's like it's going to be dual agency brokerage. It's going to be dual mm -hmm. agency twice removed. Yeah. Yeah, so because we're not going to go call Marnie and be like, hey, you want this sale? No. <laughs> Heck no. Or the blue group. Um, so, yeah, so really understanding that, but going through that in the contract is is so important in understanding it. I mean, I would love to, I mean, I always think about, oh, I'm going to find this one. And then I'm like, oh, this makes me scared because what's, if something's wrong with the house and I've got to do this side, I've got to do this side. And so, yeah, it, if you can find a match and everybody's good to go and ready to go, Aces, but if it's got to have some negotiation, let's 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 partner that out. Yeah, I've seen it in like builders. If they've got an agent or whatever, then they bring the buyer, and usually it's fine. And transaction broker, I've only seen it once, and where I felt like it served its purpose, and uh -huh. that was when a landlord was selling the property to the tenant okay and so the agent was representing the landlord but transaction broker on the buyer but we still stayed in contact with like the lender and right. stuff and made sure and it was fine i think you know you could that's the only time yeah. i've ever seen it done where i think that it was a a, a proper purpose mm -hmm. i think the, the only time that i could think of is if I couldn't convert a FISBO, but maybe I got them to the point of trust me for contract because we talked about how are you going to write up your contract? Mm -hmm. And then they call and they're like, oh my gosh, 
but you tell them I'm a transaction brokerage and my, my part ends the moment you guys sign and I walk away. Like the, now it's between you two. And if you guys go against your contract or you don't do what you say in your contract, I don't have any part of it. You know, that's the only time I can really think of, or maybe it's a family, you know, dad is selling to son or something like that. And they've got it taken care of. So there's reasons why we would, but um, I've seen it just kind of on the everyday. I've had, a, I had one come in and um, they gave an offer. It was a cute little hobby farm and they like 50 under. And I'm like, can you guys come back up? Like maybe meet halfway. And he goes, I'm just transaction broker. <laughs> yeah. And I've done that. Didn't too. even tell them they could counter. Do you know what I mean? They just said, well, they don't like the offer, you know, <laughs> that's it. That's it. They just push the papers and say, no, they don't like the offer. So super important is that we're doing what's right for them. What was that, Clayton? So just give them the check. No. On the contract. <laughs> no, I can't. Convert you can't do it. I say yes, but I'll, I'll tell them that, um, I, if we need to, we'll move forward. There we go. Okay, so we are now on page 16.4. Oh, there's the level of fiduciary on 16.4. Um, and you can see there, and I think, I think that Monica went over all of these, the low level um, relationship of a functionary, assumes little responsibility, uses low skill, records <laughs> information. Um, response to needs, processes, data, narrow viewpoint. Um, the high, high level, high relationship in the fiduciary accepts high responsibility, masters high skill, receives information, anticipates needs, interprets data. So those are all the things that we're, that we're doing. And so you can use these words. These are really good words to use in your presentations of what you do and what you're going to offer. Don't like use them in the wrong context or just to say big words to um, try to impress them. But, you know, I think we're hearing a lot. Oh, real estate is easy. All you got to do is put your house on the internet and it's going to sell. It can. But what happens after it sells and the bathroom explodes and they got to go find that other person that sold them their house and they're gone. They've got no agent, you know, all those things. There's a lot more that we do and we've got to make sure that we're telling them that. And especially if we are calling expireds or FISBOs, what is it that we're bringing to the table as their fiduciary? I am there for you and letting them know that you, we are together in this. Not just throwing it out there and hope we get some homes sold. We're together on this. So the next part of what we're going to talk about is set expectations. And that's going to kind of show up in here. It's going to help these, these processes right here. Um, but how we reach our three levels of service is largely about communication and education. We talked about that. As a real estate agent, you are immersed in buying and selling houses every day. It's your job, and a lot of us, it's our passion. Our clients, this is something they have, may have never done, and even if they're a repeat buyer, they likely have not done this since seven, eight, nine years ago. So that's a, another point that I had just said earlier. They, they don't know what's happening. They don't know what a gap, an appraisal gap is. They don't know what escalation clauses are in this crazy market. They don't know, you know, you could talk to somebody when you're making your phone calls and they bought their house in 2017 for $139,000 and it's a three, two in a great neighborhood. How much do we think it's worth now? Probably around 240 or 250 if it's still in good condition, you know? So having that conversation with them and letting them know that this is for you, this information is for you is, um, is going to be huge for them. So what did you do? I don't know what this is. Sorry. There's a lot of words. I can't memorize them. <laughs> um, so when we say set expectations, what does this mean to you? We're communicating what both parties mm -hmm. want. Yeah, during the transaction. What you're going to be doing for them, what your job description is. I mean, that's in our broker's um, disclosure, what our job description actually is and what you are going to do. There's a minimum service. I don't know if you guys have ever read the minimum service on the contract. It's three things. And there are real estate agents that do those three things 
and that's all they do. And they get paid 1% or $3,000 or whatever to do those one things, but nothing else is being done because that's all they have to do. We are doing so much more and that helps you with your commission. So when they're talking about why should I pay you this much money, this is why. I do this, 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 and this. So you're setting that expectation with them. Like we said, you're gonna do what you say you're gonna do. What about their expectations or ex our expectations of them? We have to set those. Mm -hmm. And those are actually in the contract too. Mm -hmm. it literally says in the contract that the client, the consumer will do these things. They will respond quickly for documents that are needed. They will sign the documents as, as quickly as possible. That was a statement that um, Jim made this morning. Um, what is it on the contract? It says, um, oh my gosh, in a timely yes. manner. Time is of the essence. Yeah, time is of the essence, timely manner. So what does that mean? To somebody, that may be a week. I'm going to think about this for a week, you know, but reality, we need to do this pretty quickly. So sense of urgency. Sense of urgency. Yeah. And we're going to talk about that a little bit on another uh, piece of it. So the transaction process, do you guys go over this with your clients? Like when you're buying and selling and what it looks like and what that means? Yeah, every single bit of this, this, and these are great things for you to put on your Facebook pages and do marketing with because it is a lot of steps and things that are going to happen. Partner with an agent, get pre-approved for a loan, set your clear search criteria, find your home, make an offer, negotiate terms, under contract, vendors, negotiate inspections, appraisal, pre-close, closing, post-closing. Are we done here? No. no. What are we going to do? Follow up. We're going to follow up. We're going to check in with them, see how everything's going. Does that make you a little nervous? No. Okay, good. What if it was a really rocky transaction? Never call them. Don't, don't. <laughs> Go call them. So I, I, I have done in my career, let's see, I'm up to, I'm up to 20. I can say that I probably have disappointed only one. I think it's only been one. Nobody else has told me. And I, it's not that I messed it up or anything. I just kind of flopped. And I, it was last year, it was in February, and I emailed her um, because she was going, she would have been a great client, but I did some things wrong. I didn't get an appraisal gap in writing because I trusted the agent. Um, remember, I'm only like six months in at this point. And so, um, you know, I just messed some things up. And so I emailed her and I said, I know it's been a little while since we've talked. I said, and I know I disappointed you in our transaction. Would you mind telling me how, what your experience was. I had a long email back and she thanked me for asking for that information. And some of it I knew, some of it I didn't know, you know, that had gone on kind of behind my back and I didn't address it. I just was like, okay, learning, learning experience. And I emailed her back and I said, I knew you would be honest with me. Thank you so much for letting me know it is always a learning process. And um, this has helped me grow even more. So I really appreciate it. Am I gonna get any business from her? No, but she's not gonna badmouth me. She's not gonna tell somebody not to do it. And maybe she will. Maybe I'll contact her again in six months and be like, hey, how's it going? Cause we kind of mended our fence, you know? And it took me a year to write to her. And, but I got the information I needed and she got to hear me say, gosh, I'm so sorry that this is what happened. Um, and she even in the end was like, we actually still made so much money and got our dream house. So I don't know why I'm upset. <laughs> I don't know either, but that's okay. <laughs> I, <laughs> I know. And they made $200,000 on their house. But it was her experience. And that's why, that's what I needed to know. I needed to know her side and what it felt like on her side and what she felt like I had done. So it was a great learning experience for me. And so in, in with any of them, we're, we're gonna keep in contact with them at, at least quarterly, you know, that quarter phone call because we're gonna see how they're doing, how the kids are doing, and then we're gonna ask for referrals because we told them that in the beginning when we, they first hired us that I'm gonna ask you for referrals from time to time. So we're gonna keep in contact with them, invite them to your events um, and keep growing your business. So setting time expectations, what does that mean? 
Well, my response times, if I send you a document, I'm expecting that you will review it or call me for reviewing it and mm -hmm. that it'll be, you know, you'll return it within X amount of time. Yeah. And that's important. Yeah. Um, also, I'm going to call you every Friday if I don't hear from you before. And again, it can put whatever day you want in there, right. every three days or whatever you want to do. But I usually always tell my clients, if we haven't talked and something hasn't come up, on my end or your end, we'll talk every Friday. Mm -hmm. And I reserve my Fridays for, because people fret over the weekend. Right. So I like to set the tone over the weekend mm -hmm. on Friday so that, because my family time is important to me and I want to have my weekends for myself. Yeah. So that's always been my thing, but I set that expectation up front. Perfect. What other kind of expectations would we want to do? Inspections, appraisals, we need to tell them, <laughs> sorry friends, yeah, we're going to tell them timelines, we need to tell them, yeah. and I, I do a document after the contract is signed and it tells them exactly when everything is due, mm -hmm. so that there's no, I didn't know that, mm -hmm. and I even set up automatic emails that go out to them, okay, you're three days from your earnest money being due. Have you deposited that? If not, you need to call me. So I have automatic email reminds that go out to them to tell them every single one of our time frames. Is that a command? Um, I did this before I got command, so okay. I'm having to learn command. Okay. I've only been here at KW like a short amount of time since. So what's your audit? What, how do um, you do your audit? I always just did it through Outlook. Wow. Yeah, but I just had I just had templates already set up and it would put their name in and but so we to me it together and I'll show you how to make a smart plan and then I want to borrow that. <laughs> yeah. So what what I like to do is just I take the contract and any date that applies to that contract, no matter what it is, I have it set out to go to them automatically mm -hmm. so that I also don't forget because guess who it also goes to? Exactly. Me. Right. It doesn't just go to them. Yeah. So it goes to me that says earnest money is due. In three days, I have a three day out and a morning up, mm -hmm. and it just keeps things on awesome. track. Like, yeah. Title commitments due three days from now. If I haven't heard from title, guess who I'm going to be calling today? Yeah. Hey, where's my title commitment? It's due in three days. The morning of, if I don't have title commitment, hey, where's my title commitment? So I have done that the whole time, and it just keeps me from being the nagging Nelly. Yeah. It lets it lets technology be the reminder. And you probably told them that as well. I did yeah. up front. I said, and now, you know, you're now that we are under contract, or even in my, my initial thing, it says that, you know, if we find a home or if you, if you get a contract and we accept it, then we'll go through, you'll get a timeline for mm -hmm. all the things that we need to do and when we need to do them by. And this is just to keep us on track. Mm -hmm. And everybody that I've had so far has really loved that. And I will tell them, if you get the automatic email and you have already done this, just know this is an automatic system that's yeah. going out. I try to get you taken out of it for that step as soon as it's done, but just know I'm not nagging again. Technology's nagging yeah. for me, you know, kind of thing. And I, it's so far, everybody has just been, oh my goodness, I almost forgot about that. Yeah. Because we get busy. Right. For Why sure. Get busy. So, but it's super important to tell them that. And if you're using a transaction coordinator, then that step after you're, you're, you've got a, uh, a um, contract that you have signed and it's been um, accepted, you're going to tell them that the next step is my transaction coordinator is going to get in touch with you. She's going to send you a series of emails that give you calendar dates and they're going to update you. So that communication is so important because if all of a sudden somebody that's not me starts calling them, they're like, who are you? What's going on? Where did Cassie go? You know, make sure that they know that. And then I'm still there. Um, what about like our business hours? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we need to set those boundaries. If you have children that you have to start getting to bed or a dad or a mom or somebody that's living with you, you have to start at seven o'clock, maybe you're done at seven. You know, and you can say, I, this is what I have to do. Text me if you need something, I will look at it. And if it's an emergency, there are no real estate emergencies, but it feels like it to them. So we've got to make sure we realize that. Whatever that boundary is, you know, I start at seven in the morning or do I start at nine? You know, whatever time that is, let them know and um, and keep them to that. So if they call you at 10 and you answer after you told them that you're done at nine, you give an inch, yeah, you'll take a mile. Yeah, you're done. So make sure you set that time expectation with them. So not only contractually, but actually how you work together. With 
Uh, real quick side note with command, if you do everything opportunities through command, like moving a buyer along in mm -hmm. there, it literally, you can set everything up that mm -hmm. like I put somebody under contract this weekend and I put them over into under contract and they've gotten texts, emails, and it adds tasks to mine mm -hmm. to uh, get a hold of them call wise. And then it also automatically sends me a reminder to, hey, you need to send all this to your transaction coordinator. Mm -hmm. And so I literally do nothing brain power because I'm the most forgetful person ever. So you just set systems in place yeah. using command and it's And that's the update client. Automated. You just have to, it's the update client toggle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and the other thing like, that I think would be good for, especially if you're new, what happens when you're new, you're willing to stretch your boundaries yes. further than what you will do when you're maybe not chasing every single deal. And just remember that if you get a client during this stage where you're willing to do anything, it's gonna be hard to pull them back mm -hmm. later down the road. So make sure you know what you wanna do and how you wanna represent yourself and, mm -hmm. and, and be true to that yeah. even in this early phase. And if you want to work till 10, that's okay. Like, sure. I've literally told my clients, they can text me anytime. If it's late, I might not get back to you. So I just need you to know that. But I might be up and I might text you back. Uh, I've also told mine, you might get an email from me at 2 a.m. because yes. I can't sleep and I get right. a lot of work done when the house is quiet. Yeah. That doesn't mean you can call me at 2 a.m. Right. though. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just communication. <laughs> I mean, literally just communication. Okay, our document expectations. What, what do we have there? What are we looking for? that I'm going to reach out, call, or text whenever I need a document. You're also going to get an email, and all it's going to be is just a click through. Mm -hmm. It's very simple. What documents do we need to have them aware of that could be coming to them? Title commitment, appraisal, inspection report, anything, earnest money due. Anything and everything that has to do with web base paint, yep. anything. Yeah a counter, an amendment. Mm -hmm. So making sure that we explain it to them too. I don't know about you guys, but I do not like that lead-based paint one. Hate it. It's <sighs> yes. It just does not feel like a good document to me. <laughs> you know, I'm not concerned about lead-based paint because mo most things are okay, but boy, it's like, oh, should I really get I know it. No, <laughs> right. I mean, I'm, should I really just say no? I don't because I did have someone call me and they're like, do we need to have this inspected? And it was, I think in 1971. So you probably not, and has been paid it 62 times since then. But I was like, you can, it will cost you more money. Yeah. And he goes, well, what do you think? I'm like, no, <laughs> this is, look it up. I can have some people call you that are more experts on this, but you know, and, and that's the nervous Nellies, you know? And, um, but that one makes me nervous. I always say, if that's something that you feel nervous about, yep. then I would encourage you yep. to possibly get that take down. a look at it. Yep. Because I don't want to be on the hook and them say, well, my realtor told me I didn't need to have that done. Exactly. No, 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 no. I won't tell you, you don't need to have that done. I'll probably tell you, you need to have everything done because I don't want the liability. Generally, your inspector will be able to find, if they find something that is questionable, absolutely, we need to do something. And I've had that done, especially in the older, like the the last century first of it, you know, in the, in the tens and the twenties, you know, we absolutely need to have those checked because there's probably stuff in the cellar um, and you just cover it, but absolutely. So those are all the documents that we need to make sure that we tell them what they are. Um, and then there's waivers. So inspection waiver as is. Mm -hmm. Sell a condo in Branson. Mm -hmm. You'll never see so many waivers in all your yeah. life. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> So making sure that they understand what they're signing. They're signing an as is, they can inspect the property, but nothing's going to be done. It's just for your purposes and you are still buying the property. So they need to understand that if they want to buy this property as is with inspection, you don't, there's no out. So really make sure that they're understanding those things and, um, and explaining them to them. Don't just send them to them and tell them to read them. Or sign them. Yeah, just, hey, read this and sign this. we got to go over it. Do a Zoom call, have them come in, do it on the phone together and just read through the whole document. And then our communication expectations. What is this? How you talk to, like, if it's if they prefer email, phone, text, or whatever. Exactly. That way. 
And how often? Mm -hmm. Like you're going to have some that want to know every day. Mm -hmm. What have you found today? And you know, you tell them I'll call you at 1130 and I'll tell you what's come on the market. I'm not calling you at eight o'clock because I can't do everything at eight o'clock, you know, but I'll call you at 1130. They're looking, you know, they're already looking and some of them do need that. And then others may be every other day. And then others may be just call me when you need me. But like you said, I'm going to call you on Friday and just tell you where you are. There's a couple of documents coming. There's a this, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. But set that communication early yeah. and follow it and then see if it's changed. You know, maybe on one of your Friday calls or your Monday call, you're like, am I talking to you enough? Mm -hmm. Are you getting enough information? You know, ask that question because they're going to really feel heard and seen if they're like, oh, I do that. Yeah. Just, just, just a quick, uh, temperature especially check. towards the end, I'll be like, Hey, I think it's more appropriate if we start talking every day or every other day, just till we get through close. Right. Cause, and it will be dependent upon client. I have some clients who are like, don't talk to me. I'll yeah. see you at closing. Well, okay. and, and the difference between what it's like ramping up. So when you're, when you're showing houses and how much you're together and when you're listing the house, how many times you have to talk about feedback and the people that are coming in and I need you out of the house, you're talking a lot more and then you go under contract and it's almost like, okay, where'd you go? <laughs> you know, because there's a lot of things that are going behind the scene. So back in the beginning, when we talked about the process, this is where it might be a little quieter and let them know it's okay. Quiet is good. Mm -hmm. Quiet's good. But let them know this is, you know, we're going to have an inspection. Generally, my inspectors are going to be with, able to do it within three days. So we go into our contract on a Monday. We're probably going to have inspection on Thursday. So I'll see you again on Thursday. And then it's going to be quiet for a little bit and two or three more days. And then we get the inspection notice. And hopefully it's not 142 pages. And if it is, then we're going to spend a couple hours going over that. And then now it's going to be quiet for a couple more days um, while we, well, I guess it's not going to be quiet for a little because we have some negotiations in there. And then it's quiet till we get the appraisal back. And then we talk about the appraisal, but it will seem like longer stretches of quiet than it was when we were showing houses, because that's almost an everyday thing when we're showing or we're, we have a listing, we're almost communicating every day. So make sure that they're ready for that. Um, set contingencies. What is this? What if you're going on vacation? Yeah. If you have a client, like I take a client today and I go and I have a vacation September 4th. It's very possible that we could still be together on September 4th. We may still be looking or we may be closing or we may be negotiating during that time, but let them know you've already got that schedule. I already have that scheduled. But this is what's going to happen. My partner or my colleague or my coach is going to take care of you during that time. We'll have it all laid out already. So for under contract, we'll already have a schedule of what's going on and she's going to take care of that. She can negotiate too. Or if it's showings, we'll make sure you get out and you're, you're getting um, your showings done. If it's an offer, she can write that offer. I'll, I'll pay her. I'll get her taken care of if it happens during that time frame. If you go in the hospital, may not be your first thing to think about but at some point we got to get a hold of them and be like I am gone <laughs> I'm in my A so um let them know and be ready for that I was trying to think of what um oh yeah weddings whatever might be on your calendar why you might not be ready do you work on the weekends what's going to happen if the perfect house comes on the market and you don't work on Sundays I'll, I'll get somebody for you you know, so have a contingency and let them know what that is, what that means. Up-to-date market expectations. How important is this? It's how you set reality mm -hmm. with your clients, because right now, especially with things changing like they are, if you don't set those up front or say you've been working with somebody for a little while, mm -hmm. it's completely different today than it probably was six months ago for yeah. them. Three and just ago. or three months ago, and just making sure that they understand where we're at today, yeah. especially like interest rate wise, right. and some of the things that are moving a lot faster. Mm -hmm. um, it's very important that you give them those expectations and that reality and For be sure. real with them today. Yeah. The, one of the first questions I ask when I meet um, someone who's looking to buy or sell is, What do you know about the market? and let them say in their words what they know. They probably know what they saw on CNN. <laughs> sometimes they know, and sometimes which does they not know. necessarily yeah. apply to right. Springfield, Missouri. Yeah, 
Um, so really letting them know, and that's where knowing your statistics, that's knowing your broker metrics, you know, things are selling. And I know you guys see this all the time and people have said it to you, oh, the market's crashing, isn't it? No, no one's buying, right? Yes, they are. No one's selling. Well, not enough, but yes. I had this conversation on Facebook with somebody a while back and he was like, nobody's buying in this market. And I hadn't seen it. It was weird. It was on my Facebook. And then I didn't see it for whatever reason. And that was three months ago that he posted that. And I said, hey, I don't know why I'm just now seeing this, this notification. But when you posted that, it was March, whatever. And I said, since then, we've sold 2,836 homes in the Springfield area. Well, or every day. month, hey, this is a multiple multiple offer market again, yeah. and or still. And so, you know, we need to be expecting that if we're trying to find a house at 200 grand. Yeah. And the same thing goes with interest rates. Nobody's buying because the interest rates are high. Yes, they are. I did, I did my um, first buyer's um, uh, uh, seminar and had all young people, which was wonderful because that's who I target. And I said, do you guys know what the interest rates were last, you know, the beginning of last year? No. I said, don't look it up. Don't ask your dad. Don't ask your mom. Just live in the now. And they don't know any better. You know, so they're in at six and a half percent and they're like, OK, that's what it is, you know. So getting over that and getting them to understand and even getting someone to understand who did have a three percent or has had a three percent. Well, how much well, what was your first interest rate? You know, if they were my age or older, they were eight and up. Mm -hmm. You know, my first was an eight and a half and that was twenty six years ago. My first was eight and then I refinanced when it went down. And I refinanced it three it times years. in six years. Mm -hmm. We only refinanced once and it paid it off. But <laughs> like it went down another point, it went down another point. And then I bought a bigger house at six years. I'm like, we have equity. We had like, I think maybe because it was a little house, it was 75,000. And I think we sold it, we got it for 75. I think we sold it for 89. So we had like 15,000, 10,000, whatever it was to go to the next house. And we doubled our house. You know, and that was when interest rates went down to, oh, I think they were finally at like five and a half or six, like so it went from eight and a half down. And so that was like, oh my gosh, it's so cheap. It's so cheap to buy a house. And, and then we had all the bad stuff that happened and the interest rates just plummeted. So setting that expectation and those people that are like, oh, I'm waiting for the, the, the interest rates to get back to three. Have you guys had anybody, any of your lenders say we're going to get three interest rates anytime soon? Ever? <laughs> Most of them say probably never. Yeah. And my, what I say is if it does, we've had a catastrophe. And, and you can refinance. Yeah. <laughs> well, you sure can. I mean, absolutely. But I. So let's, let's not let the house you want pass by because right. if that does happen, you can refinance. refinance. I did. You know, we forget those things when that when when those negatives come up, we forget. So we want to make sure we're talking about them in the best possible sense and the most educational sense that we can. Um, set expectations seamlessly with your KW Tech. So who's using command? Do you feel good using command? Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's yeah. You know, there's a you know, there's a lot of videos on YouTube that you can literally sit and watch and do. I have literally done a project while watching him on my phone and me on my laptop, Dan Kell, and doing it with him and yeah. pausing it and going, hold on, what if you just somebody say? shared with me the Marty um I lost the last Miller. name. Marty Miller's videos okay. and it it's like organized by kind of yeah. topic. Mm -hmm. And I sent that. Hopefully everybody got it, but it was, it's been really nice. So yeah. if I need to know something about this, I can just search, find There's that. And so go much good it. stuff in there. If you're new to it, the Marty Miller 66 day challenge mm -hmm. or whatever, that's what it, so Brian okay. started me off with um, after a crash course and by like, I don't know, you, you just get so comfortable using it so quickly that it, like, I don't yeah. even watch them now and I'm still within those 66 days, but yeah. just because it's like, use it enough. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I recommend getting it. You can't like ruin anything, you know, it's not going to break anything. So just get in there and start seeing what it does. Like, what is this? Oh, okay. Um, the smart plans. I think that is the most amazing part of what we do. I actually just sent, um, we had a tech message that Nicole sent out and I said, 
they need an applet that has a calendar on it where we can do our schedule blocking and then have it open up and like tomorrow I'm calling these 50 people. That would be awesome. I love that. Um, I know it gives me chills. I'm like, oh my God, this was so smart. I can't, let's get this. We have a calendar in our, like there'd be an applet yeah. where it's a calendar and we can schedule block our day. And so like from eight to 11, I make my contacts and I put my list of contacts that I'm going to call. So all I got to do is click on that. Those 50 people that I'm going to call tomorrow are right there. You can have it populate to your tasks. I know, but that's, you have to keep doing that. But you could, like, I mean, a schedule though. I mean, you can, you I get it over select, there. You could select. So I what, I'm doing, task what I'm doing right now <laughs> is I've selected I've selected everybody in my database mm -hmm. and then you just assign however many to you to call every day. Okay. Because you can, so you can put them just all on a quarterly on call plan mm -hmm. and then assign however many a day you want to talk to. So I did the math. And does it me. populate it though? That's right. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So you did the population so right there. Five a day okay. is, gets me through a quarterly call plan, my entire database four okay. times a year. And so that's, that's like what you have to yeah, do. That's what just, Brian showed us. Brian Fisher showed, showed us. Oh, you okay. tell it how many okay. you want it to present forward each oh, day. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they're all dumped in there, but then you tell it how many, just okay. so you're not getting overwhelmed. Okay. That's interesting. I'll go look at that then. Oh, rats. I thought I had a great idea. <laughs> you do. <laughs> no, a calendar would be super. Calendar would be super because it's a visual yeah, versus yeah, exactly. just yeah. and it dings up. You're on your laptop. And, it's on there. And for instance, a task to me seems negative. <laughs> Sometimes I agree. Versus visually, I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, that's pretty. Yeah. <laughs> that's nice. Or make it a checklist. I like yeah. checklists. I like checklists. I just hate going person. to seven different things. It'd be awesome if I could run my entire calendar off command. I that guess. would be. See, Legend. you are on to something. Okay, I got it. I know, because I'll ignore it on my phone. Oh, it's just my phone talking to me. Yeah, Google Calendar drives me nuts just because it's, yeah. So we also have Twilio. He talked about Twilio and doing your text messages. That'll be part of your smart plan, making sure that they know that, um, that you do have, I call mine my computer's phone number. So I said, every once in a while, you're going to get a, a text message from my computer um, and but save that as my other phone number so that you see that. And when it goes through. So do you know that phone number ahead of time or you could just I do. Tell them to put this in as an extra number of sure time? Yeah. yeah, you sure can. can. Smart plan across all my contacts yeah. and just set basically the text said, hey, this is my business number, just in case you get a text from it. And then we also have designs. You know, you can make your open house um, posters. You can make. Um, listing presentations. You, I mean, there's just so much stuff in there. I, I, I've done my listing presentation in there. Um, I think Maria does hers on Canva, but you can actually do it on Canva and transport it into, transfer it into designs. Um, so get in there and look at that as well, because it's just great, great ways to communicate. You can also set up posts in command. You can buy your ads and do um, paid posts, but you can also schedule like cute little memes or whatever. And you can do it on, on like a Friday afternoon for all of next week's posts and, and have that done in like, you know, 30 minutes or whatever, rather than the way I do it, which is like, oh, I thought about this, which I'm still gonna do. Um, <laughs> um, the, okay, so now this is like the last part of it, which is, um, getting your referrals. Remember I said that at the beginning um, in your listing presentation or your buyer's agency, one of the things that you're going to ask them is, or tell them is that you're going to ask for referrals. If you're doing an A plus job and they are happy with your service, we want to make sure that their friends and family are also getting that kind of service. So I'm going to ask you for referrals. But the only way that we can do that is if we're providing value, if we are actually doing the things that we told them we're going to do and um, they want to work with us more. So we've got to make sure that we're doing all of those steps, doing all the things that we said we were going to do so that they want to give us that, um, that referral. And then um, they might get a reward. They might get a little dinner to um, Domino's or Andy's ice cream or whatever it is. If someone sends you something, you know, they send a referral, send them a thank you very, very quickly. Not when it closes, whenever they've given you that phone number to give them a call. Send them a thank you card. If it's just starting with, you know, we just had the conversation, send them a thank you card. 
Thanks so much for that referral. It means so much to me that you trusted me to give them to me. And then if you do get to a closing table, oh my gosh, they were the best people. I loved working with them. Thanks so much for introducing that. I have a new friend. Go out to dinner. Go have some dinner. So that's what Brian's told me. Like anytime there's a referral from somebody, you take the person out to dinner. Like yeah. give them a $200 whatever and say, hey, the only stipulation is I have to go with you whenever you spend this yeah. and give it to them. Yeah. yeah, just just something. And then make sure that we're asking for those reviews. Is everybody asking for reviews? Well, when was the last time you asked for a review? Yeah. The last yeah. Time. yeah, yeah, yeah. Whenever they said two in the class. Oh, okay, you did in the class? Yeah. Was that in the, the proposition value? I feel like it's in I that think class. it was. Yeah. yeah, it was. I think it was Blake Stone. Yeah. Or Brian Stone. He said, he said, uh, he said, anybody you've worked with, even if you hadn't sold the house, because mm -hmm. at that point it hadn't. Yeah. And it was like, anybody you've worked with, just let them know and tell them to write a review. Yeah. And it was like, oh, cool. If I have, yeah. You know, it's free to set up a Google. Yeah, whatever. Mm -hmm. Whatever your name is, realtor yeah. page. Yeah. My Google, whatever my name is, realtor page has got like 60 something reviews on it. Just from right. like I went, you know what? I'm gonna be a review whore for now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna just fall in on it. I, I'm not kidding. And and people were like, sure. Yeah. And they go, no, I'll review your thing if you do mine. Mm -hmm. eh. And like, <laughs> I, I just needed, I needed like enough to where people can Google yeah. my name, look at it and go, 60 is credible. Yeah. You know, yeah. like 100 is credible, 50 is credible, whatever. Yeah. Make your number in your head and then don't stop until you get it. But there, you're not going to get one if you don't ask. Like literally, really people, when do people go to give a review on their own? When they yeah. hate it. Or when they have a bad, 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 experience. bad experience. Yeah. And even then they may not go and do it. So they may not. But I mean, generally, you know, if you go to Amazon, you know, you can see that's the first thing that I, I <laughs> yep. see. I go with the fives and then I go to the ones. And I want to see what the ones are like because if they're there's so many trolls and they are out there, but oh, yeah. there's some bad things. Like I, I had a bad Allegiant experience and I let them have it. Um <laughs> My husband had to rent a car and drive home from Florida with our luggage. Oh my soul. Because they didn't have enough people running their counters and we missed our, our check-in time for our luggage. Oh no. So we spent five And they went on the next flight? Next flight was the next Friday. We were oh, thinking on Friday, Lord. the next flight was the next oh, Friday. Wow. Yeah, that's a bad thing. So we spent $50 for our eight pieces of luggage and then we spent $290 to drive it home. Not happy. And the person stood there, they asked, can we get them on? Because literally two minutes late. And she goes, nope. So a human being could have said, get them on the plane. Yeah, could have said, we're sending these luggage, this yeah. luggage back. Yeah, because mm -hmm. you know you went in and waited 35 more yeah. minutes. We ran. Well, they didn't have enough people in security either. They had four flights leaving at the exact same yeah. time. And there, it's that happens Orlando, when you come back off of a cruise. Yeah, two hundred and eighty people, four yeah. flights, trying to go through three checkout lines. But you know what? Here's my thing about that: is they know that's happening, and they should prepare for I it. I know it. I know. Yeah. That's what's irritating to me. Yeah, I'm all exactly. about service and giving, you know, leniency, but they know this is going to happen. My mother-in-law that had a heart attack because I'm screaming at her to run down the runway because they're closing the doors. Oh, <laughs> It's terrible. Anyway, ask for your reviews. And like he said, be a review ho. Go on Facebook. And <laughs> you Google, you use Facebook, it's whatever. It's just your preferred. <laughs> Our class just went to the next level, Kathy. Sorry. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. We've already been there. Don't let, yeah, don't yeah. let us make you feel oh, like you haven't already no, been there. You're good. I'm going to guess it was probably Brian. Fisher? No, no actually, oh. he was tame. Oh, okay. Um, but no, you go on Facebook and you can ask, you know, have you, have we ever done business together? Have we worked together? Would you mind going and reviewing me? I've had a lot of employees and I'm like, oh, I don't know. Would I ask that person? Would you like working for me? Um, ask them for those reviews or anybody that you have helped anything, you know, to get those in there. I actually, this is the funniest thing. I, I got a text message two Fridays ago from someone at like at eight o'clock at night. And it said, um, hi, my name is Michael White. I have um, 
a condo in Branson that we bought in 2013 and I'm thinking for the right price, I'd like to sell it. Um, and I said, okay, how did you hear about me? And he goes from Google reviews, LOL. And I went, oh, I have five. So I have. And you're the Google hole. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, he said, oh, I didn't know if you sold condos. And I said, I certainly do. And so we started talking and everything. And he's, oh, oh the, the end of it was text message is the best way to get a hold of me because I have Parkinson's. So oh, it's a red God. flag when somebody says texting mm -hmm. is the best, is really the only way. Um, so that's why I asked how you heard about me. And so we went through, we talked a lot and he, and, um, he said, how, uh, he told me the address and I looked it up and it was owned by Michael White. And then he said his son's, son's name was Trey. And then I looked up their phone numbers and they do all match. They are the same people. He lives in Texas. His son is here. So it was still all kind of weird. And um, he said, how much do you think? And I said, I I'm just going to give you a very rough estimate based on what's sold. We're anywhere from 135 to 180, depending on the condition of your home. When can I see it? And um, I said, I'm available tomorrow. And he goes, well, I'm not. He said, I'm not there. My son is. Um, he, he would have to show you. And I said, well, will you be here? And he goes, not till July. So it's all, you know, still kind of weird. And he said, well, he can meet you Monday at two. And I said, that sounds great. And everything looked good. My husband is a policeman in Branson. He looked him up. There's never been any calls to that house, nothing, you know. And I said, you're going to come with me and be my partner. <laughs> so I didn't know. I mean, this was literally a stranger on the internet, but I got this lead and we're getting ready to list it. We're getting ready to, they're getting the stuff out. I'm cleaning it this week and listing it. That's an important thing that you said. Anytime you have a red flag, yeah. take someone with you. Keep listening. Yeah. Keep asking questions. And I said, I didn't think, I figured everything was okay. Cause I didn't think they were going to wait four days to kidnap me. So, you know, <laughs> scheduling it four days later for my pickup, but maybe they wanted me that bad. I don't know. Um, but reviews are important. Just sit down. You're harder to get, you're harder to get now. Just sit down. Um, if your purchasing or selling experience exceeded your expectations, would you be so kind as to give me a brief review? Also, I'd like your permission to use this in my advertising and marketing. So, do you send them a link to the review? Mm -hmm. You little review yeah. post. Is that yeah. what you do? Yeah, it's <laughs> it's in an email, and I've got like a standardized script that I use. Like, hey, okay, blah, now blah, you blah. get to share that with me. I share some with you. <laughs> um, look at him. He's got Don't work, but, I mean, I won't use no, it. I, 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 just, well, this is, I mean, this is all you need, and you can do this text-wise, and you can still do that same. That it's the same hyperlink. You just go into your Google account ish, and it'll it'll say Google with Google you. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it comes from. You ever heard of the Promise? Uh, it's a Keller Williams thing. Oh, no. Think. So promise, so definitely share it. Okay, so the promise is just, it's like a way to preface a buyer's appointment. And you're asking for two things from them, that if you do such an outstanding job, you're going to ask for a review and referrals. But it's a whole long script, mm -hmm. but that's, that's the whole thing. I do so good that you ask your friends, family, and neighbors if they're looking to buy, sell, or invest, or trade, that they use me as their agent. And then also... Five-star Google reviews are the currency that we run on in today's society. So can you give me a Google and Facebook five-star review? And that's the whole thing. And people will just go, oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then they forget all and about I'm it. I'm going to say, and I'm going to check in to see if you've done yeah. that. And I'm going to hold you it. accountable, friend. Right. And then we'll follow back up with them. And ask them three times. That's what, that's oh, what yeah, we do. And sure. as soon as we see they posted one, it, posts to, it gives us an email, and then we just... Take them off the smart plan. Send them a thank you. Yes. <laughs> also, it could be done automatic, automated. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Send them right. a thank you. Exactly. There you go. Um, it looks like. Oh, yeah. So, um, just a couple of things um, that you can kind of prompt them on or whatever is like the uh, client sold the home quickly, got their asking or above price, impressed with service. So those are things that you could put in there. So if you, if you know, with that last slide, super easy, if you're purchasing or selling experience, whatever it was, if, if you're selling experience, um, exceeded your expectations, would you be so kind and say, and they, they, they be like, I don't know what to say. You got over ask. You might tell them you got over asked. You might tell them we went under contract in two days, um, whatever it is, but you can kind of prompt them a little bit and um, help them with that if they need it. If not, I mean, you're generally going to get a really good review. You're going to be like, ah, oh, 
it's so nice. It's great to, when you guys did that in class, did that feel good when they responded to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did that too with my last one. I was like, oh, it's so nice. And I don't think, and I hadn't asked for any reviews before. Like literally that was my first time calling somebody back and asking them to tell me how I did. So Myers, you know, I did everything I could to find them a home. I actually went around the neighborhood, you know, any of those things that you might have done to um, to help with the process or had exceeded their expectations. So any ahas in the first half with, I told you I talk a lot, first half buyers. Any big like new revelations? Just kind of reiterating what you've been learning, right? Yeah. Like really, it's really like just nailing it in, like all the things that we're supposed to be doing when we're working with our clients. Okay, so you might, I don't know if you guys have seen this graph before, um, but what most buyers want from their agent, find the right home, help the buyer negotiate the term of the home, help set the price, and then 24% is other. Um, and it would be nice to know what all those 24% is because again, we could put that into our job description or our presentation of what it is that they're looking for. Because then we'll look like mind readers. So someone look that up for me. <laughs> and then here's your needs analysis. You guys have gone through this um, with your home. Like this is actually a sample of in the um, designs on command what your uh, buyer's analysis could look like, asking the right questions, finding out all the information that you need, and then making sure we're sticking to that. Buyer's lives change, buyer's world changes. So this, that's the reason why people buy. So the buyer's lives change, divorce, death, children, leaving, coming. Those are all things that the buyers, they create the, create the need for those buyers. Or the buyer's world changes, lost their job. Mother and father are sick, have to go take care of them. Those are the things that happen all the time. And so that's what we say, yeah, we're down in sales where we were you know, two or three years ago or you know, during the boom, but people are still buying. And so anybody that says that no one's buying, all of these things are still happening. People are relocating every single day. People are getting new jobs every single day. People are graduating from college and moving away every single day. So this is still going to continue to happen. We just have to be there with them and ready to go and not listen to the people who have no idea and they're stuck in their house. Um, be ready for those tough conversations. We kind of We've kind of talked talk through that and the fiduciary conversations. Um, you know, when we get to, if the appraisal comes in and it's low and maybe we're off by like $10,000 and we didn't have an appraisal gap and we contact the listing agent and say, the appraisal came in, it's 10,000 low. Will your clients come down? No. That's our backup plan. Depends on what kind of loan it is. How so? With the VA, you can get a secondary appraisal. And then with an FHA, you can ask them to see if they will review it or review your comps and go off what your comps uh, are. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah, you would, well, the listing agent would do that generally. That yeah. should be their responsibility to get their fiduciary. But I would, you know, if my clients Advise want the, the home, yeah. yeah. If my clients want the home, I'm gonna and we'll pay that if we can find it. I'm gonna fight. I'm gonna do that. Um, you know, we're gonna ask, is there anybody that you can get a gift from? You know, coming up with those things that can happen, but we really want to know too, in the beginning, did we run our comps correctly when we made our offer? Did we go in too high, hoping that it'll drop and they'll take it. Mm -hmm. So being ready for those tough conversations. The roof is not seven years old, it's 15 years old. Mm -hmm. And they're not gonna fix it. And it is an FHA loan. Mm -hmm. We're out.
you know, having those tough conversations or getting them to understand what could happen in the meantime. So we've got to be able to do that. And, or even like, this is my, this is always my apprehension is the inspection. Like that gives me so much anxiety when I'm getting ready to get an inspection because I know everything that they're saying. And I understand every word that that inspector is saying, but the buyers never do. They think that the roof is about to cave in because there's not an exhaust fan up there. <laughs> Something is, it's going to explode. You know what I mean? Like it's, so I always have to like read it. I call them and ask them, okay, now tell me about the severity of this, whatever it is. And then, and then go over there. But that is my biggest, like, that's my biggest tough conversation is the inspection. Especially if I have people that don't have money for the repairs. And then this market's a little bit better. Last year was tough. Nobody wanted to fix anything last year. This one's a little bit better, but we're back into that point again where we have multiple offers and we say, we're not going to ask for anything to be repaired unless it's over a thousand dollars or 2000 or 3000. We have to make sure our client can cover that because if it's a floor issue, maybe it's 2,500. They're going to have to come up with $2,500 because we can't ask for it. So we've got to make sure that we're ready. We're having the honest conversation and we're having that tough conversation. Take a deep breath, center yourself and be ready to look. Do you guys send it and let them look at it and stew in it? Or do you like send it and call them? My transaction coordinator sends it, but um, I'll let them know and say, hey, it's got it. Let me look at it and then we'll talk about it. Mm -hmm. And usually they're pretty good about it. Yeah. I've had some that have panicked when they've seen yeah. it. Yeah. I had, um, it was funny. I had my very, very first person that I tried to work with um, had, it was the first, and this was during the absolute height and they had a 225 was their absolute max. Um, they would go anywhere Springfield um, area, but I mean, there was 30 offers at the time. Anything that was in that 225 to 150 and 175, we're getting 18 to 25 offers. And you had to have, you had to go over, you had to have extra cash, you had to know, you know, no inspections, whatever. And so we finally got into one. And um, I think we had a little tiny appraisal gap, like maybe $3,000. Because we, I think we put, we put a bid in of like six or seven over the asking price. And I really thought it would, it would come in that way. We got the inspection back. It was only 19 pages. And it was things like there was debris in the um, gutter. There was some caulking that needed to be done. The splash guards were missing from the gutters. Like literally like yeah. tiny little things. Nothing was wrong with the roof. Nothing was wrong with anything else. My clients flipped out. I got the... I found out how much it would cost to do all the things that needed to be done. It was $980 and I was going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Nope. This is a trash house. It hasn't been taken care of. It's obvious they don't maintain it. I went through this three more times until Jim Don finally fired it for me. Cause then I got one with 62 pages and then he called the inspector, called me, told me that the inspector said the house needed to be condemned no, didn't happen. <laughs> All this crazy stuff and everything that needed to be fixed, the sellers were going to do. It was about $12,000. Oh my goodness. But they were going to do it. And he said, no, get me out of it. And he was screaming at me. And so that's a little bit my PTSD from, from inspections. And so I'm like, okay, what's happening? And I've had some other ones, but I think that's the hardest part of our. Well, I think that goes back to that setting the expectations yeah. up front mm -hmm. is telling them the inspector's job is to tell you every right. single thing, including crooked plugins right. to every single yeah. chipped paint. Yeah. It's their job to bring that to our attention. Right. So when you get that report, it's going to be our job together mm -hmm. to categorize those by major, yeah. minor, and moderate. Yeah. And we're going to do that together, right. even though the inspection, the inspector will do that for us as well. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to do that together that's and that's we on. shouldn't yeah. get lost and all of the things, because I'm expecting the inspector I use, that's what I tell him to right. do. I tell him, tell me every last little right. thing. 
And we go over it and we create a maintenance binder yes. for them. And so now they know that they need to go and check the caulking once a year around all of the water surfaces, your tubs, your countertops, and these things, you know, check your gutters, open your vents. You know, this is now your maintenance. Your this inspector just created your whole maintenance thing for you. Um, and generally they're okay with that. You just have some that aren't. But I also had an inspector. But then they were probably looking for a way out. They could that's be. kind of what I've experienced is if they're looking for a way out, they're going to choose to find yeah. any way out. I had an inspector though that called out three things that were completely wrong and my clients almost walked. Completely wrong. Well, again, when you're setting your expectations, <laughs> I know. Uh, you say we're going to have an inspection, but anything oh, that yeah, comes no, up yeah. that has a red flag for us, we're going to get another opinion. Yeah. We actually, I actually, it was all plumbing and I had plumbers and roofers come out and stand there and talk to them and they didn't believe it because the inspector said it. And I said, these are people who will make money off of you if they tell you it's all wrong. They want to make money off yeah. of you. So I don't, it's my toughest thing. It's my, it's my Achilles heel. Oh, there we go. Show homes based on your needs analysis. This is a big thing. And this is a lot that's talked about, especially if you go to um, some of the bigger um, buyers classes um, and they, like you talk with Tawny or you talk with Carrie or you talk with Jen Davis, they're not showing people 10 or 15 houses. They're showing three. Oh, I know. <laughs> my life this weekend. Okay, so this weekend I showed 10 homes over Saturday and Sunday to this one couple. Oh, but... <laughs> I kind of came in like my team lead had just kind of handed this to me after showing them some homes already. So I wasn't the original person set up the search. Um, and then they need like cream of the crop internet. Oh yeah. And they want to be kind of rural. So that I really had to do. I mean, I'm just kind of shocked that there was even 10 homes for them to even look at. Yeah. Because I mean, I've got some buyers that I send them stuff every day and they're not biting on anything. Yeah. So did they, did they pick anything? No, I mean, it's, I, oh, yeah. Well, I would say, you know, that our, our biggest buyers agencies would say, come back to the table and let's talk about the houses we've seen. I think we that need it, to stop looking at those houses. Yeah. I think that at least it was, it showed them, obviously I'm willing to go wherever, but, um, I, I think it showed them what they can get for what they're currently okay. approved for. Mm -hmm. And they're like, either we need to go one direction or the mm -hmm. other, as far as either upping their budget or changing their expectation, mm -hmm. their, their need. Yeah. So a new conversation and just, I mean, and I think that's a great way to frame it because you're, it's all for that. Like we, we struck out this weekend. We looked at 10 homes. What did we like? What did we not like? Let's see if we can regroup and get us back to where we need to be looking at them. And the other one is, is, um, you know, don't show homes that aren't meeting their, you know, if they want a three, two, don't show them two twos. If they send you two twos, why do you want to see a two, two? I thought you wanted three. No, two might be all right. Okay. Are you sure? Cause I can look for twos, but I've only been looking for threes, you know? So making sure that they are really have that mindset. And we want to know why, why did you need three bedrooms? It's mom and dad and brother and sister. Okay. They can share a room. Well, maybe not, you know, maybe it's a 15 year old and a three year old. We've got to find out why they need those rooms, why they need the, what they, what they're looking for. So only the best properties for your buyer have MLS listing um, and price information, key details, mark properties on a map, knowledge, be knowledgeable about the property, include comparable sales, and point out issues and concerns at each house. Um, remember, we are not plumbers. We are not mechanics. We are not electricians. We can only point what we see, but we tell them that someone else would have to take a look at that. Um, who brings contracts with you? So what? To showing? I keep it on me at all times. I don't yeah. do that unless they are under contract. Well, I mean, like uh, you're under agency, Offer but we're showing, gotcha. yeah, yeah, a sale contract. I always, always have them with me. I just keep them all with me. Yeah. I mean, because that's real quick. If they love that house, let's go let's, get on that car and let's fill this out yeah, and get it done. It. Send it over. Email it. Because if they want it, and especially in this market, let's get this now and say, I'm sending you one right now. We're on the hood of the car. We're doing, you know, we're getting it done. Um, 
pre-fill one out in command. That's yeah, you can do, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can do it that way. You can do it from command. If you don't want to do it there, you can say, we want to do this house. Okay, let's go sit on the porch and I'll I'll do it on my phone real quick. Or I'll put my hotspot on my computer and we can get it done. Or we'll go over to Brahms and I'll get you an ice cream and I'll write up the contract and we'll do that. Be prepared. If they're ready to buy that house, let's buy that house. Let's get ready. Let's go. Same thing with open houses. You should have contracts at your open houses too. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is your home toolkit. Um, I used to have I used to have a box, but now I have you know I have my tiny little car and it doesn't fit in my box anymore. But your shoe covers, masks, flashlight, umbrellas, sanitizing wipes. Um, does everybody keep toilet paper in their car? <laughs> I keep toilet paper in my car because it never fails. I've got a four year old with mom and dad, and they gotta go to potty. And it's a vacant house and there's no toilet paper. <laughs> the wipes. Yeah. That's so anything like that. Bug spray. Bug spray. Yeah. That's not on there. I have been covered in fleas in a yard. Yeah. Ooh. I know. Uh, I don't think it's on there either. Oh, no, there's tape measure. I think that's a big one. Um, inner, yeah. Flashlight. There's no power. Yeah. I don't see pistol anywhere. <laughs> yeah. oh, no. Because it's concealed. Hey. It's concealed. <laughs> Oh, here it is. Safety one. Oh, sorry. Always. It's right there. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Safety first. So, safety, we just talked about that. If you get a red Something flag, if you have not met somebody at the office, do not meet them at a house alone. And I did this too. Mm. Ooh. Um, I did this last two falls ago. It was a guy that I had been talking to for months on the phone, months and mm. months have been talking. And he found I the house. Chills. I know, found the house he wanted to see. I get there, he pulls up, and five men got out of the car. Oh, I, I get, I freaked out. I said, hold on, talked to them. I kept them outside. I was out here, and they were looking at the pool. They were doing this, and I just kept like over here, keeping them there. And I said, I'm gonna go unlock the door. And I unlocked the door and like walked away, got back and I got on my phone. I'm like, I'm gonna check on this roof because I don't know how old this roof is. And so I'm on the phone and I checked, I got onto the market center. Cause I, again, I'd only been here for like six, this is like six or six, six or seven months. Got on the Facebook page and said, I just got to a house. Five men got out of the car to come look at this house. Somebody come help me. Somebody come here. And I put the address down. I got phone calls. I people like pulled in, like it was, but I never went inside the house with them. I just like, yeah, I don't know about the roof, and you know, I just, yeah, I had no idea. It was who all showed up. Um, Elise showed up. No, no, uh, Amy showed up. Uh, not Trey. Um, the other one, the tall. Ross. No, no, no. Um, oh Ross. my gosh, he's with Grady now. Oh. Colton. They were, they, Colton. No. Oh, Alex Moore. Alex Moore showed up. Um, Kim Mooneyham called me. Elise Ellis called me. Elise Riley called me. Um, I, someone else showed up and I can't remember. But I was like, oh, are you guys here to show the house? And they're like, yeah, we wanted to see the house, you know, because I was crying. I was in the oh, I was, yeah. yeah. I was out there. I was like, I can't believe I didn't well, myself. What was the deal with the five dudes? Huh? What was the deal with the five dudes? It was it was grandpa and then like five grandsons that all lived together. Did you show anyone else to that person? No. I only had this once and it was with the commercial property and this not me stereotyping, but it was four Russian dudes uh -huh. that showed up. And oh God. stop. <laughs> so but they walked up, which is what concerned me. And it was it wasn't like there wasn't businesses open where I was at, but it, the fact that they walked up instead of drove up gave me kind of my spidey sense. Yeah. Went up. And I was like, what'd you guys walk up for? I mean, I just like hit yeah. them head on because I thought they're going to know that they met the wrong chick if that's what they're thinking. And they're like, oh, our other business is just down the road. So like a block away. Uh, so that's why we, there was no reason for us to drive over. Yeah. I was like, okay. okay. Yeah, I mean, at first, I, I, I mean, I stayed as calm as I could and I just started talking to him and I asked him what he, I forgot what he'd done for a living. I go, what do you do? And then the kids are like, oh, what do you do? And like finding out who they all were so that I could be like, I gotta look them up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Honestly, I think they're okay, but like 
they looked shady as all get out. It yeah, was and they're not okay. Five, five, of, yeah, right. five of got out of a sea brink. Like, that's a tight fit. <laughs> I don't know where I was going to go. Maybe the trunk. I'm not sure where I was going. <laughs> <laughs> The board is really good at, like, if there's somebody targeting, to, yeah. the board will let you know if yeah. there's the somebody problem that's is, a is problem. that when you are talking to somebody, you're not necessarily going and looking at the board. I know. Well, I oh, know they have, like, on their Facebook page and stuff, if there's, like, there's people out there doing the calls. And, there yeah. was a guy a couple of years ago that was just, like, calling realtor after realtor there is after he realtor. came back again he's yes. the one that yes. yeah he was back this like late winter early spring yeah. he was back again yes and he has had um ex parte viol he, he's had ex parte yes. against him and yeah that was crazy um, but there, there are some psychos really out there like, yeah. and we're easy target because we're in a usually a vacant home mm -hmm. or a home that nobody's at yeah. by ourselves I I have I always let my husband know where I'm at and how long if you do not hear me within yeah. this amount of time yeah. I do too <clears throat> Um, our job is to sell homes. Our job is not to show homes. <laughs> That's something to distinguish. Yeah. The showing homes is fun, but if it doesn't make us any money, it's just a hobby. Okay, some of the reasons why buyers are hesitant, they are afraid to commit. They don't like some minor detail of the home. They feel like they haven't seen enough homes. They need to sleep on it or get an opinion of a trusted advisor. So, um, What's an objection? What's an objection? Um, uh, how can we overcome this objection? The first one. Have you guys practiced any of these, like overcoming objections? I've been doing that recon call. Yeah. Isn't that great? More than just Friday, but yeah. like I'm trying to do it more throughout yeah. the week. I love the recon call. Yeah. It's amazing. So, you know, there's, there's the old thing. If you sleep on it tonight, someone's going to be sleeping on it tomorrow or is going to be sleeping in it tomorrow. Um, the fear you know, of loss. They have yeah. this, the fear of loss as I said. Yeah, so, what, so this meant all of your criteria, you know, are you rating them? You know, are you giving them the rates, you know, having them go into the homes and is it a one to five or a what, one to 10, whatever you want to do. It meant all of your, what is missing? What is it that you're concerned about? And I know what we've done in the recon call is they say, well, what if the perfect one shows up tomorrow? Well, we do have ways to get out of the contract if one shows up tomorrow, but do you really want to take a chance? Because we've been looking for six months. We found this one now. Do you really want to take a chance that the, the next one is going to come up tomorrow? Um, haven't seen enough homes. <laughs> they use the they they like to use like marriage and dating like getting married you know I, I'm afraid to get married because I don't know if I've seen enough women. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean it's they don't like some minor detail of the home. <laughs> we went there again. <laughs> uh, you know they and this is this is probably the most common to me. Don't you think they don't like some minor thing mm -hmm. in the home that they can't get over. They just yeah. can't get over themselves. They're, yeah, they're it's number one. Like is yeah. the so they don't like the pink tile. Just commitment. You can paint tile. No. There's all kind of tile paint. You know, you can have still have that beautiful tile on there. Just paint it white. Super easy. You know, have overcoming that and making sure that that's okay. Now, if it's something like it doesn't have a fence and they don't have twelve thousand dollars to put a fence up, it's not really minor. And they've got kids and a dog. Mm -hmm. That's not minor. So I'm going to kind of be okay on that. But if everything else fit it, do we really want to lose this one after we've looked for six months? Do you think, you know, talking about those and they're afraid to commit. I mean, all of these, like, these are all kind of the same kind of things. Those one, three, and four. Um, we really need to be having conversations with them. Do you really want to buy a home? You know, mm -hmm. if you need to see more homes, after six months of looking, or you need to sleep on it after we found the perfect home, do you really, you know, what are, why were you buying to begin with? Oh, our house is too small. Okay, is it gonna get bigger? While we're looking at this home, it's not. So revisiting those is, is super important. Um, guidelines to going back, decision-making, always go back to their motivation. I just said that, like, why, are we, why were you planning to buy to begin with? Go back to their needs and wants, advise them as a consultant and fiduciary, allay their fears, solve their challenges, calculate the cost of waiting. So that's another one too. So today we know we can afford this house. We've got the interest rate. We've got the price where we want it. We don't know what's going to happen the next time we find a house. 
today we know. Um, solve their challenges. It's pink tile. I can't stand that pink tile. All right, I got somebody that can paint that white. You know, I don't know if it's the right school district. Okay, let's look it up real quick. Let's see what it is that you're worried about. Ask them what it is that that's that there's just so concerning about that. Okay, here's what sellers want, and we're down for probably the sellers. What sellers want most from their agent: help price the home competitively, and help sell the market. Ugh, help sell market home. Help seller market home to potential buyers. Help sell home within specific time frame, frame and help seller find ways to fix up home and sell it more. So um, price the home is the number one thing that they, they want from us. Um, where do they all get their home price right now? Zillow, <laughs> Zillow's the devil. It, has Zillow been right for anybody? No. Hell no. And they're always surprised. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And and it's so, and it's both so, ways. It's not only high, it's low too. I've seen them, I've seen them come in and I'm like, what? Because it doesn't know what to compare it to. Yeah. Because it only has so much information. Yeah. I, and and that's what I tell them when I'm talking to them too. I'm like, I am literally pulling information from all of my resources and I'm checking them out to each other. Accurate sales information. Mm -hmm. They are Zillow does not know. I just always say Zillow does not know what a home sold for. Yeah. So does this not know what a home they're guessing. Home. Market the home. Terribly guessing. Specific timeline, ways to fix up the home. So those are, I mean, and they're all pretty much even. And then there's the other. Again, I don't wish I knew what the other was. Um, but that's what they're looking for. So we need to make sure that we are, we are doing, uh, in, our, in our presentations, we are meeting those needs. We are talking about those things because that's what they're looking for. Makes it super easy. Price, time frame, conveyances. Um, the price, do you guys set the price? No, I've done that. I've done everything wrong. Um, give them a range, tell them where they are, tell them the repercussions of all of those different price points. If we have a price point between 210 and 235, what could happen at 210? What could happen at 235? I like Blake Cook and his numbers and showing him the numbers of the market. Mm -hmm. and, and if it's priced too high, it's on the market about three times longer mm -hmm. than one that's not. And it goes through price reductions and it gets stale. And that's the biggest thing. You price it too low. You have money up. And that's scary. So, you know, when we're, when we're trying to, you know, we're trying to kind of be sneaky and be like, oh, we're going to go low so we can bring up bids and, you know, make really people work for it. What happens if it doesn't? 72 sold. <laughs> what happens if it doesn't? What happens if you put it on the market for 165 and you only get one offer for 165 and they wanted 180? So let them make that price. It's going to go for 50,000 more than what that is right there. It's a freaking aggravating time frame. We do need to ask what they're, you know, they're selling and why they're selling. Are they moving? Is, um, uh, Children, uh, someone's being born, you know, they, they've got to have, we got to know what their time frame is um, and when they're selling. So we also can use that in our um, strategy because if they need to be gone in 60 days, we got to be aggressive. We can't go in 30,000 above and not doing any repairs. You know, if they need to be gone in 60 days, we need to be pretty close to market and it needs to be tip top. Or if they don't want to do anything to it, then we need to come down. So they've got to know the strategies um, around those timelines. If I don't have a timeline, I need to be out of here. Is that a good thing? I'll just sell it whenever it sells. I'll sell it whenever I get the price I want for it. Kind of wasting your time. We're going to be marketing. We're going to do open houses. We're going to call. We're going to check. We're going to hear agents say, why do the price so high? Well, that's what the client wanted. Mm -hmm. I didn't price it. That's what the client wanted. But do they really want to sell it? So make sure we're having those conversations. And conveyances. Are they going to leave the refrigerator? Are they going to leave the washer and dryer? Are they going to leave the swing set? Or are all those going away? Oh, that icky pool in the backyard. Be prepared to take that with you. 
because I'm sure no one's going to want that moldy pool, you know. So be prepared for that. Same thing, sellers' lives change, sellers' world changes. So, you know, like I said, they're selling because more babies are coming or babies are leaving. Um, they're getting a divorce, changing jobs. All of those things are still happening to all of our sellers. So we've got to be prepared for those. Make sure that we get in there. There's three things that sell a house, price, condition, and location. The two things that the seller can control are price and condition. So again, that's where we go back and we talk to them about the ranges of the, um, the comps for the house that we have and see where they want to be and see what the possible outcomes are with those different prices. We price high, it could sit longer. We price low, we might not get everything that we want. So we've got to make sure that we're talking about that. What we ha have you heard them talk about the fish pond in recon? Mm -hmm. So there's three outcomes. Oh, yes. You yes. can explain to a seller. There's three things that will happen. Little to no showings and no offers. Showings and no offers. Showings and, oops, that's three. Showings and offers. So if we have little to no showings and no offers, what's the probability of that? What's the reason? Price. 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 It's too high. So you explain that to them in the beginning, remember the outcome. If we have showings and no offers, what might be the problem? A too feature. High. A feature could so still be too high. high for what is in the house. Mm -hmm. Could be the condition of the house. Layout. Layout, it could be any of those things. So we have to be negotiable, negotiable with that. Or we get lots of showings and lots of offers. Those are the only three outcomes. And they've got to see those. Um, he actually has like this little fishing pond. And so you're going deeper and deeper to get into it. Um, but explain that to them. In the very beginning, these are things that are going to happen. So, and I think you've probably been told too, if they do go high, we want to make sure that we get in writing that if we go high and you don't recommend it, that after two weeks, with little to no showings and no offers, we're going to reduce the price and make sure that they understand that because little to no showings means it's too high. Again, showing them from the beginning. This from the very beginning. If they this do is, that, you're yeah. going to be less And money. if they say, no, I want to keep it that price until I sell it. <laughs> okay. Then Great advertisement for me. Have my sign in your yard for six months. That's okay. I'm going to have my name out there. You can call me, let me know. They don't know what's going on with that house. It's priced too high, but that's okay. I got my free advertising. I'm not going to be doing a whole lot because I can't do any more to sell this house, but I am happy to list it for you. That's all can be done. So get that in the beginning, and that's a great way to show it to them. And then if if you forgot to do that in the beginning, if you forgot to um, get the price change in the beginning and it's been like two weeks and you come back and they say, what's going on? There's no offers. You can say, well, remember when I said little to no showings and no offers, it means the price is too high. It's time to change. And how much do we change our price, do you think? 10%. About 10%. Mm -hmm. So now we're lower than probably where you recommended to begin with and let them know that as well. Like we can't just re reduce it a thousand dollars. We can't reduce a $200,000 house to 199. 20, 10% is $20,000. And it probably would have gone at 189 and now it's 180. Hmm. So have those conversations. I don't know that I'm speculating. Like, why'd they make a big price reduction? Right, and, and that's what happens is like, okay, well, and sometimes it can be, it. yeah. And we know, and other agents know, they priced it too high. Mm -hmm. But that's you know, not what the Zillow, the right. Zillow fans exactly. are, the exactly. fans only Zillow folks. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I feel like when people call me and they're like, I saw this on Zillow. Can you please Zillow get off of Zillow? Was, I always say, was that sent to you in, in the marketing yeah. that I'm sending to you? Yeah. I've set you up but based upon yeah. what Quit you told me that you want. Yeah. Zillow's not your friend. Remember, Zillow's the devil. Yeah, sure. I told you that yeah. it is, and I always ask, yeah. is that in what I have set yeah. up? for you That's because good. I set up for you a customized search based upon what you said. And in my 
email that goes out in that customized search, it says, if you have needs have changed or you're not seeing what you want, let's talk again. I said, Zillow doesn't customize their search to you. They just send you junk. And they right. also, they're not, they don't keep up. Yeah, I had one client that sent me like four or five listings from Zillow. They were all pending. All pending. All pending. Yeah. I say yeah. that Zillow doesn't know that that's not available. Yeah. And you can and look at it get see. frustrated. I think I looked at one today and the last time it was updated was June 6th. Exactly. You know, and so, yeah, they're not, they're not keeping up with it I for sure. I just that, I mean, I don't know what I would do if I lived in a disclosure state because I wouldn't be able to rely on this, but I just tell everybody Missouri is a non-disclosure state. Right. So anything you that you see on Zillow, it's not accurate. It's guesses. And I also tell It's them, a zestimate for a reason. You know, <laughs> Zillow versus a, a MLS search where, you know, MLS, you're getting it as soon as it goes live from the other agent, where Zillow is going to be delayed. That's why you see them yeah. pending before you even seen them is because they've yeah. been on the market for two days. Realtor is the same way. Realtor.com is yeah. the same way. Oh, yeah. I tell them about all of those. Yeah. I'm like, you're not getting your information direct from the source. What I'm sending you is direct from our required source we have to use. I think Zillow is only good for like FISBOs. And like, if I'm looking at canceled listings or expired listings for a client, that's the only way to get them to see them. Yeah, you can see, yeah, the you can see all the way. Yeah, because we can't share that link. Yeah. So I know if FISBO goes on the market, Mm -hmm. if you have an so, alert yeah oh that's nice, nice. Just so you can set alert. that up in your <laughs> you can set that up in a google alerts because i used to have them if my company name was mentioned anywhere news oh. it would automatically email me if my name is mentioned anywhere it automatically emails me oh, that's yeah, cool. I just sometimes i get so people that aren't me in obituaries but i mean <laughs> still it's interesting to know there's somebody else with the same name i'm just trying to beat the isas yeah i know mm -hmm. right <laughs> Okay, so the next topic, because this is going to go with that condition, sensitive seller conversations. What are some topics that might be kind of sensitive to you talk about? You have too many dogs in your home for it to be shown. Okay. Because they love their pets. Mm -hmm. But Me nobody too. wants to, I do too. Nobody wants to come in and see this with five dogs running around. Yeah. Is there somewhere we can, we can put your dog for a little bit? Nope. You're going to have to find some block of time to work outside of your house because- yes. The reason it's been on the market for two weeks is because the only time you can show the viewing it is appointment in times. the afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. And or, let's get to the or, there's a smell when I open the door. Yeah. If I oh, smell it, oh. and I know that's that's very sensitive. There's yeah. a smell when I open the door, mm -hmm. which means there's a smell when anyone who's coming to see your home right. that opens like, the door. That omitted probably half the ones we looked at the other mm -hmm. day. And it's like, well, we can't smell it through the pictures. So right. you know, yeah. like and I, and I agree because you've got pet odor, you've got smoking odor, could be marijuana, um, all kinds of odors. And um, of course, can that be mitigated? Yes. Yeah, call the listing agent and ask. Yeah, it can be mitigated. They can put it, we can put an ozone machine in there for a week and get all of that stuff out of there. So I talk about that, you know, with them for sure if they're gonna sell, but I mean, if the buyer, do you love the home? Because we can get rid of the smell. Yes, the first yeah. one we went into, I did mention an ozone, but but it's a sense of conversation to have with them. When I sold my last home, um, Kim Mooneyham was my agent. That's how I became an agent. Was Kim Mooneyham, and um, I had a cat and a dog that liked to pee on top of each other's pee in my hallway, oh. the only place where it's carpeting. Very expensive carpeting because it was that super good Armstrong pet, blah, blah, blah. It was $1,000 just to do my staircase. That's how good this park is supposed to be. Yes. Still like to pee on it. I had to clean twice before our showings. I cried because I had four people in my house on Friday and nobody wrote an offer. That was how I felt. I was the seller and I knew it was because of my cats, my cat and my dog peeing in the, in the hallway. And she's like, no, you can smell it, but it's not terrible. And it had a warranty. So I had a transferable warranty on it too. But you know what I mean? Like it was, she was really good with me. And um, I said, I tried, I cleaned it twice. I had someone come out three weeks ago. I had someone come out two days ago and do it again. And, I, you know, I'm just crying because it was the reflection of me. I felt like it was a reflection on me and I was a terrible home, you know, person and, and she was really good. She's like, 
it happens. I, she said, there's homes that have it and there's homes that don't. Some people are very sensitive. Some people are not. I ended up getting like five offers, you know, over the weekend and we didn't, couldn't even have an open house. But in that moment, when you have four people come through your house in like three hours, you feel like crap. I felt horrible. So having that conversation in the beginning, and she was the same way. She was like, I go, come over here. This is it's the only carpeting in the whole house. And this is where my dog and cat like to pee. And I've cleaned it. And she's like, I don't think it's too bad. You know, but I have the downstairs to have a basement. So then the basement gets a little musty and that can, you know, come up. But anyway, she was really good to keep me calm, but that's what's going to happen. Those are those sensitive issues we got to talk about. Now with my dogs, I just told her, my, I, I boarded my dogs for five days. I said, there'll be no dogs in the house. You can show anytime you want. I was the ideal seller. Like do whatever you want. I'll leave the house and get a hotel if you want me to. <laughs> I'll get out of here. Um, what other sensitive topics might there be? If there's needed repairs, needed like repairs. if you say to get you the price that you're wanting, you need to do the following things. Yeah. Because nobody wants to be told their home is outdated, whatever. Mm -hmm. You can fill in the blank with whatever you want. You know what I have seen and when I'm showing homes and it's so funny to me is, is the deck staining. That someone won't buy a house because the deck stain is worn away. Mm -hmm. Because it's a lot of work to restain <laughs> the deck. It is, but I'm like, it's the deck. It can be fixed. Um, what about if the house looks like this? <laughs> yeah, that'd be perfect. That's gross. <laughs> that'd be a perfect conversation. Yeah. We got to clean this up. You can't up. leave your house looking like you're filthy. Yeah. So I actually do a concierge service where... Um, I tell them everything that I do for my 6% and I pay the, the buyer's agent 3%. All the things that I'm going to do, I'm going to do professional photography, I'll have a drone, I will do open houses, I'll market, I'll do all of this stuff. I'm going to negotiate, I'm going to get the inspector, blah, blah, blah. For 7%, I'll stage and clean it. No, wait, hold on. Yeah, for 7%, I'll stage and clean it. And so I will have somebody come in and clean the place out completely. And then we'll have someone come in and stage it. Either I'll have help, like Amy can come in and tell me what to do um, with what they have, or um, I'll have her do it completely if it's a bigger one. If it's a smaller one, I'll do it. And then for 8%, I will take care of all the repairs that need to be done under $1,000. That's some serious value propositions. Anybody that I've offered you has taken it. Uh, now, and I, if you offer a 10 percenter, you can be like, this is my number one thing. <laughs> and then, then, hey, and then I'm being serious. Yeah, and then yeah. maybe you never get someone to buy that 10, but maybe they look like, oh, I can do eight or seven. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, is, I mean, we're talking about Let's things like, doing and this was like during the inspection. So if they come in and they say, you know, we, the, we would really like the bathtub to be caught. Is that going to stop you from buying the home if the bathtub isn't recocked? No. Okay. We're all right. Does it have to be recocked? Yes. Okay. I'm going to get it cocked. I'll take care of it. Mm -hmm. And so I did that on a home. Yeah, $50 isn't going gonna... right. to. We're not going to make or break a deal. But I also can go. find all the people to I'll do it. Them trying, right. having, them, <laughs> having them trying to find a cleaner. And this is what happened with my last one because we were at 7% and I took care of all the cleaning and he was empty in the house. So I didn't have to stage, but the house was a hundred times worse than that. Disgusting. Um, and um, we had a couple of things like the, the wash, the shower started leaking and something else happened. I can't remember what it was. And I said, and he kept calling and nobody, he couldn't get anybody to come over and do the work. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, do you want me to take care of it? One more percent. And he goes, take care of it. Mm -hmm. And I had it. Oh, I, we had to do some um, drywall fixes, a couple of drywall fixes and some sanding of a banister. He couldn't get anybody to respond to him. He didn't have time. He was working, mm -hmm. you know, and so he was getting delayed every day because he couldn't get so these did things you done. in the contract before you did it. Yeah. 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 Heck yeah. I'm just double checking. Oh, yeah. It's in the contract. I, I'm like, yeah. It's in the contract. Like, oh, and it's worried. in an amendment to yeah. a leasing agreement. Yes. And it also says right in the away. special agreement. It says in the special agreements what I will do. All of those are on the special agreements. And then it says, if, if the house fails to sell, any expenses occur, incurred by the selling agent will be reimbursed. So if I did, if I got it cleaned and did something Stage. else and like, they, and, and they did not, 
wouldn't accept an offer. It's really what it is, you know, because we can keep it on the market forever and sell it. They, you know, but if we get offers and they say no and they say no and they say no, they got to pay me back. And then the listing expires and they don't renew. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. and you're going to pay they back. back. So it's in there and I nobody's ever said anything. But it's been super helpful for everybody that's done it because they didn't have to take care of anything. I call. I had junk removal at the last one. It was a $400,000 house, so it was worth it. But I literally had to have a junk removal. They came out and worked three people for five hours. Oh, my gosh. Wow. It's wow. a lot of junk. And then my housekeepers, three housekeepers for six hours. <laughs> but it was a 4,000 square foot house. It was yeah, big. Sure, yeah. but still. But yeah. it was done. We had it done in two days. And we get our pictures and get on the market mm -hmm. where he would have been still looking weeks and, and yeah. weeks and weeks. Yeah. That's the other thing. I think it's important to have those conversations. I know you can do this, mm -hmm. but how long do you think it's going to take you? Right. And every day that it takes you, that's mm -hmm. more time and, yeah. and life's going to get in the way and you're going to be delayed more. My yeah. pet trim that's in. been on in the garage for six Seven years. years. <laughs> you're not going to get to now just because I told you to. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So to have those conversations. And have solutions. Come up with those solutions and um, make them good for both of you. Um, great agent and client communication provides a strong foundation. It's the same thing. It sets and manages expectations, creates peace of mind for your clients. That's the same page as the beginning. Yep. We came full circle. And, had, and enhances your credibility. Mm -hmm. That was the same page as the beginning. <laughs> That's the photographic memory. So client violates fair house. Okay, this is a tough one. I, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think mm -hmm. I've ever had it, uh, but I know it's happened, and it's happened even recently. <clears throat> if a, a, a client violates fair housing laws, remind the client of their obligations of the Fair Housing Act, um, discontinue representation of the client, report to the incident to your broker, fully document the installation and consult attorney. So that's if they um, refuse to sell based on yes. gender, race, uh, religion, blah, blah, blah. I had, I had this happen to me. You did? Mm -hmm. It was yeah. a commercial building. Yeah. And it was actually um, the person who owned the building was in a position that they knew all of this. They were, a, I'll just say they were a lending personnel at a bank. Ooh. And I, he was, he specifically said the nationality that visited the building. And I, he goes, you know how they are. And I was like, no, I don't. Why don't you tell me? And yeah, I even reminded him, hey, you're, this is very dangerous for you to be talking like this. And I don't think that your employer would appreciate it either. Oh, wow. And we made it through the transaction. He ended up accepting the offer, but I was like, you are, you are very dangerous yeah. right now. We gotta be so careful with that. Yeah, and in in this, which area, is why you have a lot of good old boys. Oh my word! You have a lot of good. Old, <laughs> you have a lot of good old boys around here, and not everything. Sometimes they say something. Good old boys. <laughs> and I finally just had to say, you can't be present at any of yeah. the showings. You can't be. You're you you can't talk. Yeah. And at closing, you need to go in and you need to go in and sign your part hours after us, because I just was so and I represented him, mm -hmm. but I was so concerned he was yeah, going to say something, yeah, and we were going to all be in trouble. And I even told him that, yeah, I'm like you are jeopardizing your position at your bank. It's and it's in your contract, you guys. Oh yeah, I read it. Like I actually read that one verbatim. Um, there's a couple of things that we kind of gloss over because there's a lot of here to and therefores and within. I, I'm like, oh my gosh. And I told them what it says, but there are several, and that's one of them that I read verbatim. No discrimination. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I kind of sort of make a joke and I'm like, if this is you, let's part ways now. Well, and when somebody <laughs> says, well, you know, I, my, I, my skin already begins to crawl because you don't know what I know. Mm -hmm. And I don't think like you think. Right, exactly. exactly. Um, no commission is worth your reputation. This is our Y4C2 tease again. And we go over these all the time. Win-win or no deal. Integrity, do the right thing. Customers always come first. Commitment in all things. Communication, seek first to understand. Creativity, ideas before results. Teamwork, together everyone achieves more. Trust starts with honesty. Equity, opportunities for all. And success results through people. So these are all the things that we've been talking about through all of our classes in Ignite and how they come into play in every single thing that we do. And, and my mom and dad always taught me this, um, like do the right thing. If it feels like it might be a little wrong, it's, it's wrong. wrong. Yeah, it's, it's wrong. wrong. 
and then figure out. And if you don't know why it feels a little wrong, because it does sometimes, go ask someone. And go ask Don or Jim. Like that would be the best place, especially if you feel like it's in that weird area. You go, I don't know. I don't know what's wrong with this, but I know there's something wrong. Um, Follow your gut. Yeah. If another agent asks you to do something and you're like, well, what? You know. Um, 14 step marketing plan for listings. Capitalize on your listing by marketing your brand at the same time to bring in more listings and more buyers. Remember, we have our triangle um, listings, leverage, and leads. Leads is at the bottom because that's what's going to keep us stabilized and it's going to give us our listings. And then finally, we get our leverage to handle all of those. Let me see what this 14, if I've got it here. Hold on just a second. It's in our book. Is it in your book? Okay, good. 16, 12. I don't think it's on, I don't think it was in my. Pages. No, it's not even in my pages. Yeah. So there's your marketing plan. Price your home competitively. Um, advise you on how to attract buyers showing your home in the best possible light. So those difficult conversations. Place signage in the yard. Respond to all buyer inquiries immediately. Optimize your home's internet presence by pasting it on the MLS. Market your home on multiple websites. Um, post your home on um, Propriety Search app. And you guys know on your homepage, you guys can actually create like a hero page on your website and put that, put like your um, featured listings on there. So, um, and um, there's a tutorial on it too, but you can, um, it's, it's really an easy thing. You can make as many pages as you want on your website. So if you guys have not built your website out yet, find a, a class or find um, some instructional video because it'll it'll do it. And that's that's where I market my Facebook too. It's to my website. And so it's going to go to that listing that I'm marketing on my website. And so they can see all of that. I also have um, get a home analysis page on there. Um, I have any of my current listings on there. So you can make sure that you're um, marketing that and that your, your brand is out there. Um, create flyers and comment cards for viewers of your property. Um, so you can do that, you know, at your property. I do a little notebook. I got this from um, Mike Brown. There's a little notebook and it has the description of the property. It's got a pretty flyer. It's got all the disclosures in it. It's got the utility bills, how much the averages are, where they're at. It's got the neighborhood information. You can get that from list reports, from RPR. So it'll tell you where all the schools are, tell you where rest, how far away restaurants are. So there's a whole bunch of really great information you can put in there. Just a little binder that they can look through. Um, but you can put surveys out so they can take a look and um, they can fill out that survey. If the customer, if your client sees it, that's okay. It's the information on your house. They may call you go, oh my God, this person said this. Okay, well, now we can talk about it. Um, but get that feedback. If we're not calling them, which we should be calling anybody that's looking at our listings and asking them for feedback, if they're not placing an offer, um, we're doing our client a disservice. We need to call every single one of them. And I've, I've even tried to go do feedback on the MLS or no, the, the Supra. Mm -hmm. It never works. It never works. It never works. And so I probably only, I probably only get called like once every 25 showings by a listing agent. But that could be the market is so fast, it doesn't matter what my client thinks they're going to sell anyway. I guess that's their opinion, but I do get some calls and they're, you know, and then other ones, I'll just give them a call and say, man, it was great, but it wasn't for my client or whatever, especially if it's a KW one, I like to give them feedback. Um, include your home in our company and MLS tours. So market your home, market your listings to everybody in the office. Make sure that they're seeing it, like right up and front. Go, hey, do you have anybody? Yeah, you can make flyers. And Amy, you see Amy um, oh, Hudson. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they're on the wall. You can't not. You can't not see them. What she's looking for. Mm -hmm. So do that for your client too. Target active buyers and investors in your own database. So look in your database and see um, who is looking for that home. And um, but and then and then target that neighborhood. Make those phone calls. Um, provide you with weekly updates detailing the marketing efforts, including comments and prospective buyers. So you can do that weekly or you can do that however they want. If they want to know after every single showing, mm -hmm. that's what we're going to do. Um, so we want to make sure that we're doing those things. I will tell you on Thursday, I'm doing an MLS class from 11 to 12 upstairs, I think in the command center. And it's these little secrets I didn't even know about. I went and found them yesterday after she had taught me to teach the class. Well, and one here, oh, you said 11 to 12? 11 to 12. Okay, yeah, it'll be upstairs. 
and um, reverse prospecting, finding other agents across the board, how to see if someone in their save their search history is looking for that item, that, yeah. that house. Oh, right. You can email them. That. Yeah. yeah. And you can email. I had no idea that even existed. Yeah. So and you um, said that's Friday, Thursday, Thursday, Thursday from 11 to 12. And I was like, oh my God, I found five things that I've never seen before on MLS and how to do them. And I was like, this like makes my life so much better. <laughs> um, the message you put out to attract prospective, prospective buyers and sellers is everything. Why would they want to contact you in this market? What would you do if they did? These two questions are at the heart of all of our effective messaging. So <laughs> who, um, who got scared the first time someone actually said you, they wanted you to be their agent? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh my, yeah. oh my God. Really? You want me to do it? <laughs> yeah, it happens. But what are we gonna what are we gonna do? We're gonna learn, we're gonna ask. And I would and I even tell, you know, that's part of my uh, messaging is I'm I'm in a market center of 450 people that have all the information. So if I don't know it, I'm gonna be able to get it. And I'm going to be able to talk with them and I'm going to be able to use that. And I'm going to be able to help you in the best way because I have this. Then they say, well, why, why should I take one of those people? Well, because I'm going to be more fun. I'm going to be a lot more fun than they are. Just stick with me. I may not know everything, but it'll be a good time while we're doing it. Yeah. Um, your, well, your MLS for listing reflects your brand. So get it right. Have the right documents for your region and market center uploaded. Super important because you can get fined. If you miss your um, lead-based paint, you, you get fined for that. If you don't get your disclosures up there, if you don't get your disclosures up there, the other people are going to think, what are you hiding? That's the first thing I think when I can't find seller's disclosures. When I look at a house and I'm like, eh, is it okay? Is it not okay? Are they going to tell me anything? So get those documents up there. Uh, utilize the right professionals to get great pictures and floor pans. Is everybody using professional photographers or are you using your iPhone? Both. Sometimes I'll take them just initially, so I have something to put up, and then I'll schedule the professional ones to change out for like for like pre-listing or something. Mm -hmm. Show yeah, and that's totally fine. Um, I I love the websites that show all of the crazy pictures that are out there being taken. Oh my by <laughs> There's a finger in there. There was one the other your day. Your reflection in the mirror. Yeah, your reflection in the mirror. And you're not dressed very nice. Yeah. I I just love it. Or like there was one that had it like it was in like, a, it looked like a telescope or like a peephole kind of thing. So it was like really big and then really small. Oh my gosh. I hate like, the ones that are all distorted. Yeah, because like, they stretched it out. Yeah. To make it look bigger. Yeah. Um, and set the right schedule for your listing. So um, making sure that you do know when your buyers are able to be out of the house, you know, if they're gonna be out for the whole weekend. I would say that, you know, maybe we're going to list it on Thursday. No showings on Friday, please. They're going to be out the whole weekend. Saturday is free, you know, free, play. whatever, whatever it is, whatever's good for your clients. Make sure you set it correctly. Right. Okay, this is another, this is from the designs on command. There's all kinds of different flyers that you can do. There's open house, there's just listed, just sold. You can make postcards and download it to something else, to a different company to have them send them out. So make sure you're getting in there. It's fun. The thing with this is you just literally go in and put the MLS of the house that you're needing to market and it'll pull everything for you. So all the pictures are pulled in and all you got to do is drag and click. All the information is put in. You can change it. You can add whatever you want. Your pictures, no, your picture is not in there. They don't have that yet. But they actually do have a, you're welcome. They actually do have, um, there's like five, and I can't think of what it's called, but it's like already done. So you can like pick one and everything is filled out. You don't have to do anything to it. You can, but it's ready to go in, in that picture. It's on the very first page. Uh, proper signage. So within one business day of marketing the property, it has to have um, the sign out. If you have, if you are doing no showings, it's no showings for everybody. So you can't say no showings until Saturday, but let your best friend, the agent next door go in and look at the house. And we had those issues where houses were no showings for three days and then going pending the next day. So no showings means no showings for everybody. 
Make sure your signs have the correct information on it. If it's got your name on it, it also has to have KW on it. If it has your phone number on it, it has to have the KW phone number as well. Okay, so we went through that one really, really fast. Any ahas in that one? Yeah, <laughs> that's what she took from it. <laughs> Be a review whore. <laughs> I love Justin Johnson's thing. <laughs> we'll never forget the review. Right? Yeah. Never forget that. Um, so success with other agents, and this is what I talked about um, a, a little bit at the beginning of the class, is do everything you can to make the, the transaction as easy as possible. Have your documents all lined up. Have it good to go. The people outside of this office aren't as, they don't have the same morals and foundation. I know they don't, but you do the right we thing. Have, I had somebody that was really nasty and ugly and I'm praying for her still. Oh. <laughs> I'm praying for her. If I am afraid so... if I ever cross paths with her, well, just give her show up to the clothing, which I'm sure is because she was afraid I might murder her. Oh. Well, so wow. she was a peach. Oh wow. She's not in this office because I would have already reported her. Five years. So and on the transaction side. So I'm like this little sneaky, like nobody even knows I exist, but I've heard all uh, the story. Mm -hmm. You know, like I've heard it. You're welcome. Thanks, you guys. Yeah, we're all done. Um inspection negotiations. I've heard yes. a good yeah. million. I mean, TCs are double as agent therapist. I mean, yeah. as a first person they see when they walk in the door and then thanks everybody um, online. I hope you enjoy class. Just people. like unload. So I feel like I've heard enough scenarios that I need to be able to get through an inspection. Right. Stop share. I'm I'm lucky. I haven't really had any bad agents. Um so I'm very fortunate with that. But like I said, I'm I'm pretty um amicable. Except for negotiations. Like, you know. See everybody in the morning. Oh. Tuesday, we got coaching at nine, don't we? Yeah, we do. Yeah. Wednesday, Wednesday. You coming in? You coming to coach?